Hello to all of you. Well, you should have us live now. We're very excited to be going through the South African property update. We are very lucky to have some of the most esteemed authorities within the South African industry who are going to be sharing with us tonight. And the whole idea is to make it a Q&A. So it's not going to be road presentations or PowerPoints. You've got a number of different people from different sectors of the industry who are going to come together tonight for a conversation. And we welcome you into that conversation. And so before we get started, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people booked from all over the place. As this is specifically about South Africa, I'm just interested where everyone's come from. So if this is your first webinar. You'll see there's a little box up in the right hand corner. It's a little chat box. And there's two reasons we're doing this. First is to test whether you have the ability to write where you come from. And second is whether you have the ability to find the question box. So we want to see where everyone has come from. And while people are writing up their different places, I'd like to welcome uh, Michelle, Andrew, David, Neil, and Lee, who are going to be our panel tonight. I'll go into more details about who they are and what their experiences are. But wonderful to have you all online tonight. It's, uh, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a huge amount of value for people. Welcome. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. So we've got uh, Port Elizabeth, Zimbali, Cape Town, Bloemfontein, Belito, Poch, Amsterdam, <laughs> Amsterdam, Dubai, a uh, lot, of, lot of South Africa, Cyprus. Jeez. Trying to see if there's any other countries here. America, Krugersdorp, I think that's another country, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cape Town, <laughs> McGregor, Paris. So we certainly got people from all over. Well, okay, let's let's rock and roll. I want to give you a quick introduction, then I want to explain who we've got on the panel. So, as Napoleon said many many centuries ago, the right information at the right time is nine tenths of any battle. It's clear that we're in very interesting and challenging times, but it's all about trying to get the right information. You know, every morning we wake up, and whether we watch the news, listen to the radio, read the newspapers, there's a consistent plethora of news about the shutdown and corona etc cetera, etc cetera. and what i tend to find and what i've learned over the last 20 years of property investing is that people always tend to focus on the right hand side of the curve they focus on how markets are dipping and, and the massive chaos and all the problems and what they don't focus on are what are the fundamentals what are the important what is the data telling you and about long-term investing which is what tonight is all about i'm going to share with you a little bit later tonight around how we talk about people and, and how actually things like Corona create social change. And this is a slide we created in 2015 about how more and more people are adopting the internet, whether it's publishing, social media, e-commerce, and how they're coming together now and creating social commerce. And you know, 15, sorry, five years ago, a lot of people thought that this was sort of really out there. Five years later, well, everyone's on Zoom. It's interesting, this is a picture of me and my university friends we left uh, UCT in 1998. We actually had our first catch up where we had 16 friends from six different continents all coming together. And the thing that I found most interesting was the majority of the corporate people had never even heard what Zoom was. Zoom in December last year, so December 2019, had 10 million users. At the end of April has just passed 300 million users. That's a 30 fold increase in less than three months. And then when it comes to AGMs, you know, the South African Stock Exchange actually had its first virtual AGM in the last month. And again, I don't really understand these things because we had our first uh, virtual AGM in 2014. In fact, I think, Neil, you were part of that. But my point being is that we're all being forced up this adoption curve. And what's interesting with any adoption is that generally it starts with people that like to go towards something. So pleasure, a classic example is, is mobile phones, where early adopters got mobile phones because it was nice to have. But ultimately, everyone does it because of pain. And if you didn't have a mobile phone today, you literally would not be able to operate. And, and that's why everyone's got a mobile phone. And what most people don't realize is that you move four times more away from pain than you do towards pleasure. So as much as pleasurable times are nice, it's painful times that are going to get you to actually take action. And that's really a lot of what we talk about when it comes to Wealth 5.0. That's why we are doing tonight. Because for me, it's not just about the information and the knowledge. It's learning from other partners who've got the experience, who've got the knowledge so that you can make educated and informed decisions. And, you know, in terms of 
just tonight we're going to we're going to show with you a number of different ways that people can engage but what i'm super excited about is that people actually have the ability now to invest in property literally from a hundred dollars and i'm going to share with you later how that's possible you know using technology and they also got access to you know south african opportunities england america australia etc you know we no longer have to choose so if at any point tonight you sit here thinking this sounds too good to be true i can't get access i don't believe that's a reality anymore each and every one of us has access now using technology and so that's why tonight we want to literally run through this update and i wanted to share with you you know there's just some things that i think are valuable clem sunter who i'm sure many of you have heard of is one of the top five strategists in the world he came out with an article on the 22nd of April, so about a week ago, with the different scenarios for South Africa and for the global economy. And I'd highly recommend you go and look at that. It's on Biz News and News24 and all over the place. I've also put it on LinkedIn if, if you're interested. The other one that I think is important is that I don't think anyone here tonight is a currency expert. I am certainly not. I have um, actually done a lot of work, uh, both with Clem Sunter. He actually wrote chapters three and four of my book. And I will share my book with everyone who's on uh, tonight. But also James Painter wrote chapter two of my book. And if you're wanting to know where the RAND is going, I, I don't know anything about currency, but, but he is a very good predictor. He's like a weather forecaster. And we've actually done a number of different uh, webinars with him. So tonight that wasn't the purpose. And he's got, he's got predicting abilities uh, where they use patterns and, and they actually use Elliott Wave. And I'm not gonna bore you with all the details on which way the RAND is going, et cetera. So I just wanted to mention that because a lot of people asked us around the RAND and what we thought is or isn't going to happen with the RAND. What I do think is very important when it comes to the RAND is that you mustn't be reactive, you need to be proactive in your investment criteria. But without further ado, I wanted to welcome our four panelists. And the first <clears> is <throat> Michelle. Now for me, Michelle has, uh, you know, well, not only as, is, is she actually a director on a residential property fund, she's run the TPM Credit Bureau and the TPN Tenant Profile Network for 20 years. As I understand it, Michelle, you are the go-to person when it comes to data, information and research on the South African property market, both residential and commercial, and not just your opinion over the last couple of years, but literally two decades worth of research. And so for me, you know, one of the reasons that it's so valuable to have you here tonight is everyone else is going to often has their opinion or they go and talk to their local estate agent or financial planner or brother or mother, whereas you can actually look at the trends of what's happened over the last 20 years. And that's my understanding of, of, of the value you bring to people tonight. Is that correct? Thanks, Scott. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in such a fortunate position that we collect data from so many different uh, property contributors. Um, from a person with a, a room, literally a room in their house that they rent out for five, eight hundred rand a month, up to, as you said, the, the listed property REITs with 10, 12,000 properties in their portfolio. And we can look at the different portfolios and we can understand uh, what's happening from a research perspective that informs the market um, of where we're going in the future. So a very fortunate position. Oh, awesome. Well, it's wonderful to have you online. and. Uh... We, we're definitely starting with girls first, but, but also you, you have the most data over the rest of us. We all have opinions and you have data. And as uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon says, is that if two people walk into his office and they're having an argument on opinion, he'll always make the decision. Whereas actually they'll let the data make the decision if someone can prove the data. So that's why we thought we'd start with you first, because uh, your, your data is more valuable than all our opinions. Thanks, Scott. I, uh, the next person is Andrew, and uh, Andrew runs a, a property training company uh, called Wealth Builder. He was also one of the founders of SAPIN, which is the South African Property Investor Network. He's a property investor himself, a property coach, and as I understand it, has specialized in both South Africa and the UK over the last, I'm not going to try and give a year because I, I don't know, to be honest, Andrew, but I've known you for a long time, and I know you've been helping people invest in both markets for a long time. And uh, again, it's wonderful to have you tonight with not only the, the South African Property Investor Club hat on, but also as an investor, both, both in the South African and the English market, and to give us your context of what is actually happening on the ground. So it's wonderful to have you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I mean, Scott, I think I met you 15 years ago in London, right? Um, I go back to 2000. Yeah, I remember that. 
So, so I'll go back to 2001, you know, where I bought my first property in Dirts, but really got going in, in, in the UK in 2005 and for eight full years, I kept it simple, Scott, you know, I'm not an expert in commercial, but I've always invested in residential. And the one thing that I was taught is go buy the residential property that the average person will always be able to rent or sell. And I've adopted that investment philosophy in the UK, now 15 years in the UK and here in South Africa. And that's what I specialize in is the residential market. Awesome. Well, we look forward to your uh, feedback on what's happening, you know, on, on the ground, as I say. The next is um, for me is David, and David has a story which he probably doesn't know even. But uh, back in 2004, when I was starting my, my first property company, IPS, International Property Solutions, I took business cards from estate agents from Durban all the way to Cape Town. I literally drove from Durban to Cape Town. I stopped in every little Pundoki and took the estate agents' cards because I thought my business model would be to take those estate agents and then sell the houses in London. And I then read some articles somewhere that uh, STB B. Buchanan Boyers was the best conveyancer in, you know, in the country. And so I managed to walk in and talk to your managing director at the time, it was Andy McPherson, and pretty much tell him that I had elected Buchanan Boyers to be my conveyancers in England. And um, at the time, I had no idea who Andy McPherson was, and I subsequently got told that he was known as the bulldog and that everyone was absolutely terrified of him. But he was actually immensely kind uh, to me and along with Ian Fife and others actually came over and supported us at our big launches in London, uh, did a lot of branding and, and work there. And so it's and, and ironically, a lot of the developments that we sold to start off with, you know, all the big developers were working with Buchanan Boys already. So it tied, it tied very nicely together. And so, David, as a, as a director of STBB, you know, for me, it's beautiful to go back full circle 16 years ago uh, and to, you know, be, be, be getting your thoughts because as both a lawyer and a conveyancer, you really do also have your finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening with estate agents, what's happening with developers. Is the deeds office, we were talking about it while we were waiting to open up, you know, this webinar, is the deeds office still going to remain open or closed or what's going on? So it's, you know, I'm really, really grateful to have you here and thank you for representing for Canon Boys. Yeah, Scott, it's an absolute pleasure, and it's a real privilege to be part of this uh, esteemed panel as well. Uh, I didn't know the backstory, so that, that's very interesting to, to know as well. Um, great that uh, you guys come such a long way with Buchanan Boys. Um, yeah, my, um, my background is, is, is a bit more complicated. I actually started off in Port Elizabeth uh, in, 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 in litigation, and I carried that through when I, when I moved to Buchanan Boys a couple of years ago. So uh, I'm actually heading up um, uh, together with our, our, our other partners in the, in the litigation department in our Cape Town branch. But uh, we work very closely with the conveyances and I've obviously got my finger on the pulse when it comes to all sorts of property disputes, uh, be them large, be them small, be them residential, be them commercial. Uh, you know, we, we really do play that support function in, in our, for our conveyances. So we, we certainly keep uh, up to date from a conveyancing perspective and from a litigation perspective. So. We sort of we sort of have our finger on the pulse when it comes to what's going on in the market from a from a litigation perspective as well as a conveyancing perspective. Well, you know, based on some of the research that people are going to hear tonight and a lot of the questions that our community's been asking, you know, whether we want to actually litigate or not will always be a discussion uh, to be had. But I suppose more importantly, what do we do if people aren't paying our rents, residential or commercial, but yet the banks expect us to pay our mortgages? <laughs> you know, and it's uh, it's the situation we, we find ourselves in. The last person on the panel that uh, that I wanted to uh, to to introduce, and uh, Neil and I have known each other for for a long time. Neil very kindly pointed out that I have blue teeth just as this webinar started, so I'm now completely <laughs> conscious every time I smile. Uh, there's something clearly wrong with this lighting, which uh, which which irritates me because every time I look at myself, I feel embarrassed. But uh, Neil Neil and I met back in 2007, and if I if I understand it correctly, that was the year he actually launched the Real Estate Investor magazine. And one of the things that I respect Neil for is that I often say that he's the, you know, he's probably the most well-known or networked person within the South African property industry, both both residential and commercial. He knows all the right people and the top people. And I've often said, you know, Neil, you you very much represent the voice of the investor. You, you know what's going on. You've got your finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening and and where things are going. And um, before I before I let you speak, I just wanted to show two other slides here quickly. And uh, Neil was actually the one that introduced me to Dr. Dolph de Roos, who wrote the book. Uh, um, I want to say Property Going Global. I'm like, no, I think someone else wrote that one. Uh, Real Estate Riches, and uh, which was part of the Rich Dad Poor Dad series. And this was actually back in 2012. 
and Neil invited me and another guy called Brendan Brown, uh, right in, well, arguably the last crash when America, there was tremendous opportunity. And this was us with Dolph Deruis. If you can see, this is actually Dolph Deruis here in Phoenix. And we were actually at the auction. So everything we're talking about now happened. And we all know this, but, but most of us have very short-term memories that it happened less than a decade ago. Uh, and this was us in Phoenix. And this was actually Neil, myself, and Brendan in Orlando, which is where we were trying to buy a property uh, back in 2012 on our first uh, trip to America to, to actually buy properties. But anyway, Neil, I... Uh, I uh, had lots of fun times with you over the years, and it's awesome to have you here, as, as I said to you, as a voice for the uh, investor. Great. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate the invite, and it's lovely to be part of the panel. Um, yeah, look, I've been a real estate guy. I actually, my background is actually in media. I worked for NASPAS for a number of years, um, and they've always been a sort of a leader in the media giant for a number of years. I left there just after the year 2000. Um, and during that time while I was there, I was actually a part-time investor. So, um, and, and I used to buy and sell properties in the 90s, uh, which was quite lucrative because there wasn't capital gains like to the level that it was uh, at that time. And then of course in 98, um, I mean, probably a lot of people recall, everybody ran from the hills from real estate because interest rates are 25.5%. Can you believe it? You're sitting today at 7.5%. Nobody wanted to touch real estate for level money. And so everybody got out, so everybody sold everything. And uh, so I pretty much did the same and really re-entered the market uh, in, in 2000, 2001. And, and by pure fluke, um, I met a property developer who wanted to offset a whole lot of properties. And uh, so my journey started as an investor and I bought 22 properties uh, with 5,000 rand deposits. And I just left my company at NASPAS and I didn't have a job and I got 22 bonds. And this was in 2002. So people that say that you need a job and all that, but I know the criteria has changed quite significantly. <laughs> but anyway, so that's how the property journey started. I then, uh, I, I then uh, uh, owned shares in an advertising agency and we launched Remax into South Africa. So I was an intricate part of that. And uh, then I followed the property gurus all around the world. You know, the dollar, the, the Dolph the Russes, the Robert Kiyosaki's, and I went to every single event possible. And I met a guy, in fact, it was Dolph who introduced me to a guy by the name of, his name was also Andrew, um, but it wasn't a walker. Um, he was, uh, he headed up a magazine called Personal Real Estate Investor, which was based in Phoenix, Arizona. And through Dolph, actually, that's how I brought the brand to South Africa. We've now turned into a platform. And we've been around for over 13 years. We, we now, you know, our, most of our audience is digital. So being a magazine and digital, we weren't allowed to print now because we weren't an essential service, which we've actually slipped into quite easy because our, our audience is digital. But yes, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful journey. I'm, I'm very fortunate to the people that I've met and interviewed over the years. I've met quite a few celebrities and, and really got the insights into how they've made their money and what have you. Um, and yeah, so it's been, it's been a fantastic journey and it's wonderful to be part of this panel. Thank you, Scott. Oh, awesome. Well, listen, wonderful to have you all. And, uh, you know, I think a good introduction from you all. Thank you very much so that people get a context. And hopefully you see also why we invited different people. Um, you will notice we didn't invite any estate agents or any developers uh, on purpose. So it's investors and people that are in the industry, etc. cetera. Um, we just wanted to get different context. It's not for or against. It's just we want a broad, uh, broad base of, of opinions as to where we're going. So the first thing I wanted to get started with, and if you don't mind, what I suggest is we just go in the same order that we that we just uh, we just used because I'd like each of you just to give me your opinion on what is happening right now in the residential market in South Africa. What are you seeing? What are your thoughts? You know, what 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 should people know about the the market at the moment? Michelle, if you don't mind, if we if we start with you again. Sure. Okay. Well, Scott, let's let's start with the number one challenge uh, facing landlords uh, today, and that is rent collection. Um, so we track rent collection every month on about 800,000 tenants around the country, residential tenants around the country. And effectively, what we're trying to understand is how they pay their rent, how much rent they pay and um, how they pay it. So for us, a tenant is in good standing if the rent um, has been paid by the end of the month. That can be paid on time, paid uh, in a perceived grace period or paid late, but by the end of the month, it's paid up. In 2000. 13, 2014, we peaked with 86% uh, of tenants in good standing. And it's slowly come off the boil since then. 
Um, in 2019, we were ranging at 82, 81% of tenants um, in good standing. At the beginning of 2020, for the first three months, we dropped down to 79% of tenants in good standing. And this is not unusual, Scott. We do sometimes see the effect of the holiday hangover in Q1, where we have a, a little dip of um, good standing behavior. But then it always picks up in Q2. Even when we had the global financial crisis in 2008, the one quarter we dropped 11% to our worst performing at 71%. So I want our viewers to keep that in mind. The worst performing, Quarter for good standing tenants in the global financial crisis was 71% of tenants in good standing. But it picked back up in 2009. What we're seeing now though is entering the lockdown. So we had 79% in, in Q1. We then entered the lockdown on um, in, in, in April, the 26th or the 27th of, of March. Meaning that um, they were already during the state of disaster, there were already tenants that had lost their income. And so for April, for the period of April, right now as it stands, we have 15.62% of tenants who are partially paid, and we have 14.9% uh, of tenants who are in the did not pay category. That is effectively 30%, it's just over 30% of tenants who are not paid up. Said differently, it's 69% of tenants in good standing remembering in the global financial crisis that we bottomed out at 71%. And this doesn't even take into account May. Coming into May's uh, rental payment, um, we fear that um, collections are going to be a lot worse, and that's because people have legitimately not had an income uh, for the month of May. Many people have legitimately not had an, had an income for the month of May. Um, so number one uh, challenge at the moment is, is payment. And the second biggest challenge coming into May is can tenants move on the 1st of May? Um, or are we stuck with the tenants that we have? Uh, and right now, um, looking at the draft regulations, there's absolutely no clarity on that. We have made a submission um, and apparently we will get our responses to submissions um, by midday tomorrow. Um, and the, the direct question that we asked is because it's not clear in the draft uh, regulations, can tenants move? Or um, if we interpret it um, at, the, at the harshest level, the next time tenants can, can move is when we're in level one. Um, real estate um, activities for commercial can commence in level three and residential in level two and people are able to move freely in level one. So we do need clarity on this um, as soon as possible. Awesome. Well, I don't know if it's awesome, but thank, thank you for the data. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Andrew, cool. from your side. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. Some awesome stats. And, and I think the thing is, right, you know, right now, Scott, is it's just a standstill, right? I mean, if you take my, myself as an example, I was offloading a property uh, prior to this in, in March, and obviously nothing's happened. And the question is, how long is, is this going to go on for? So if you look at the sales, I mean, obviously, uh, what I've seen is a lot of sellers have withdrawn their properties from the market um, and hold them because obviously, you know, if if, if, if you had to ask me, Scott, is now the time to sell? The answer is completely no. This is when people need to hold on to onto the assets. Um, I mean, I do feel that property prices are going to go uh, are going to go down. I do feel that if there's anyone out there that is feeling the pinch or the squeeze, you know, now is the time for, for those landlords or owners to call the banks and request the relief. You know, just to try and ride the wave. And I think the biggest thing, Scott, for me is, um, you know, should we all be slightly concerned i think we should be i think it'd be silly not to be but you know scott going through the 2007 2008 recession i was sort of baby boy then right um, and what i realized is that through that baby recession there was a lot of panic um however and through that i saw a lot of investors in england a lot i'm talking landlords with four 400 properties in the uk go under because of cash flow so just from my side scott i'm seeing this as a cycle right yes it's a very hectic cycle naturally because we're in covid 19 no one predicted this we all predicted moody's and we knew that it was going to happen and you could plan for that but no one could plan for what's happening in covid 19 now so i think you know what i'm seeing in the residential market is not much you know, sellers withdrawing their properties. Um, as Michelle said, there's no movement with tenants going in or out, and there's no leeway with that. Um, and to be fair, my, my view on that is I'm actually happy that's happening. You know, the World Health Organization has rated us in the top five countries in terms of abiding by the regulations of COVID-19. So I think my message to everyone, Scott, um, is that, that this is a cycle. 
that we will get through the cycle. Um, and if, if anyone is a, is a property owner out there, is now is the time to really hold on to the asset. Well, they always say you only, ever, you only ever lose money if you actually sell. So we'll, we'll come on to that a little bit later around uh, incomes and everything else. David, from your perspective, you know, where do you see the market and, and specifically where, you know, based on, on what Michelle was saying about tenants not being able to move out, you know, in the UK, Australia uh, specifically, they've actually made it mandatory where you're not allowed to kick tenants out for, I think I, I get it wrong, but it's different periods. It's three months in the UK and four months in Australia or whatever. Where do you see us legally sitting in front of not only where the market is, but where, you know, where, where we're going in terms of the stuff? Yeah, thanks, Scott, uh, and thanks, Michelle, for those, those valuable stats. Um, look, I mean, from our perspective, you know, being a law firm in, in, in this industry, you know, um, the market, the, the way we see it is really split into two, if, if I can say it like that. You, you know, on the one hand, you have your property market in your landlord-tenant sphere, and then on the other hand, you have your property market in the in the seller and the buyer's sphere. You know, you know, you look at you look at them in, to, in those two spheres, and What's happening in the in the from our perspective is from in the um, in the tenant and the landlord space is obviously we've been inundated with 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 queries regarding you know can I can't I um, you know things like vis major and, and force majeure have been thrown around these these fancy Latin terms um, payment holidays are being thrown around and you know because banks are giving payment holidays I think that. The, the, the perception is now that landlords in general must get payment holidays. Um, we've seen massive uh, retail stores, you know, sort of clubbing together and saying, you know, we, we're only going to pay 25% or whatever percent it is. So there's this there's this this massive gearing up, I think, on the on the tenant and in in the tenant and landlord sphere, both from a commercial perspective and from a residential perspective of of of, of what's to come. I mean, it's it's not really a calm, but it's certainly something before the storm. And um, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak about it a bit more, uh, you know, as we as we go along. But the, the problem that we have in, in that environment at the moment is that these are such unprecedented times in South Africa. You know, from a legal perspective, you know, law is based on precedent, and at the moment, we don't really have solid precedents to go on. Um, you know, insofar as something we can con compare to a COVID-19 and a, and, a and a national lockdown. Um, you know, so it's very difficult to advise clients as to, you know, what their rights are with with a certain, you know, with a certain degree of certainty. Because what we can do is we can say, look, this is how we interpret the law at the moment. But, um, you know, moving forward, we don't know what the courts are going to say. So, we're, you know, we're in uncharted territory when it, when it comes to those those kinds of things. But insofar as that sector of the property market is concerned, inundated with queries, and it's it's, it's predominantly regarding rentals and can I pay and can't I pay. Um, if we look at it on the other in, in the other sphere, you know, regarding your sellers and your buyers, those kinds of things, we you know, we, we're finding that people are still doing business, um, albeit on, on a lot low on a lot lower levels, um, but people are still concluding contracts. And people are coming up with very innovative innovative ways to to sort of get these contracts through and get the sales done. You know, whether it be virtual tours of properties, whether it be finding very creative ways on, on signing agreements, uh, and, you know, and, and those kinds of things. So business is still being done to that extent. Uh, you know, bonds bonds are being processed, bonds are being granted. So that that is still sort of rolling on. Um, but people are also finding themselves in very precarious positions insofar as, you know, well, my bond was granted before the lockdown and now after the lockdown I've, I've, I've had a pay cut or, or I've lost my job now, now what happens I can't afford to pay the bond anymore so we, we are seeing those kinds of queries come through um, and we're also we're also seeing people trying to find ways to make these things work as opposed to just backing out so uh, Andrew I, I hear what you say and, and I 100 percent agree with with what you're saying so far as you know now's the, the wrong time to sell but for those guys who are wanting to sell there is, you know, where there's where there's a, a means, there's a way. So people can still do business, um, and and we have seen people doing business. But uh, so yeah, it's not it's not all in doom doom and gloom, but it, it it's certainly a trying an unprecedented time, Scott. Yeah, David, it's interesting, you know, where you, where you say that uh, when someone wants to sell, you know, my father always taught me where there's a will, there's a way, and uh, which is what you're saying. But but equally, there's another side yeah. to that point that I've watched people in chaos make the most money so you know one of my 
best friend's parents bought a house in Camps Bay in 1992. And when everyone else thought Mandela was getting released and South Africa was going to be in civil war, you know, he bought a house in Camps Bay for 500,000 rand that to, you know, today is worth many tens of millions of rands. And, uh, you know, so, so sometimes there's always a, a perspective to both sides of the fence, you know. And, and, and Neil, from your perspective, it, it brings me into, you know, the question around what you're finding on the ground, but also having the ability with, with Real Estate Investor Magazine to have interviewed many of the most successful, you know, investors, both residential, commercial, developers, etc. What are you finding from them? Because I tend to find that the top people have a different mindset from the masses anyway. But what are you, what are you, what are you experiencing? Well, look, I mean, the residential market, um, you know, Michelle has said some quite telling stats in the commercial market, it's worse. I mean, it's uh, pretty much, um, I mean, if you look at what FMB figures were last month, uh, I think you're ready in the month of March, sales were down 40%. Um, if you look at it now for this month, April, it's zero. So, um, so I think what people don't realize is the effect that COVID-19 is actually having on not only in South Africa, but on the globe. It's impacting all our everyday lives. And, you know, generally I'm an, an optimistic kind of guy, but I think we have to be realistic as to what's actually happening out there. This COVID-19 is run, and from the, the people that I've been speaking to, the experiences I've been getting, you know, the biggest problem I'm finding with people is the mindset out there. Um, a lot of people believe that, yeah, we're going to go into level four lockdown. You know, that we could reverse straight back to, to level five again. Uh, people think it's always going to go down. It's going to go down to four, three, two, one. And we are very much in the early stages of this uh, pandemic in South Africa at the moment. And I can tell you, we're in for a long haul. And this is not business as usual. It's not business as usual. And everybody has to reset themselves completely. I can tell you now the impact of this. This is, this is measured with the Great Depression. This is not even the global financial crisis of 2008. Now, it sounds like the worst story. It sounds like the worst bad news out there because remember, we will always get through this thing. Um, we've just got to understand, we've got to guide our way. Nobody's an expert in COVID-19. Nobody. Nobody has lived through times like this before, so nobody can actually say, listen, this is a normal upward and a downward cycle. It absolutely is not. And that is what the top businessmen are saying. We've got to actually sit back and we've got to guide through this extremely carefully. Um, the time that we start getting down to two, one, whenever, and everybody starts litigating each other. I've already seen threats coming across the internet, you're not paying your rent, all this kind of stuff. People, you don't actually realize people are in distress. The unemployment is, I mean, more than a million people have lost their jobs. Businesses are closing down. We've got to understand that the reset in this economy is not going to happen overnight. It's going to impact on the residential rentals. It's going to impact on commercial rentals. It impacts on our economy. It's, it's, it's huge. It's, be, we, cannot, we cannot fool ourselves that this is a, a little blimp in the, in the cycle that COVID-19 is having. It's, it's major. I mean, we did our, our download. We, we prepared a, a, a lockdown real estate guide. And it's everything that we could put together. We had massive downloads. We had record downloads of this thing because people are looking for answers. And that's why we're seeing people on all these Zoom webinars and all these different webinars because people don't know where to turn. It's not a normal. So we recover, we get back to normal. Um, I've had very you know, close discussion with some of the banks. And you know, I reckon it's not three months people are going to be able to start paying their bonds off. It's going, this is going to carry on for a few months. What are the banks going to do after the month four? Month five, month six. I reckon we're in for a little bit of a long haul, guys. We're only in month, month one of a lockdown. And this thing could go up or down. And it's beyond our control. We don't control it. It's, you know, and, it's, uh, and everything that you can't control, you pretty much have to just look at the things that you can control. And that's what I'm saying you've got to look at as an investor. And I don't want to, I don't want to say what they are now because I think we will discuss them in detail. I'm not being negative. I'm just saying plan for the worst outcome, expect the best outcome, but prepare for surprise. You know, you just got to be ready for this. But, but I, I think we're in for quite a ride. But let me tell you, tell you what, when we do come through on the other side, I can tell you what, it could be the most positive thing that could ever happen to this country, ever. I think it could be boom times par excellence. But it ain't going to be probably at the end, tail end of this year. I think we're looking at next year or even probably two years' time. I think South Africa will could be in a very different space. So the messages are not all positively, Scott. So, so um, and I think, 
tonight tonight wasn't meant to be a beauty parade i'd rather we telling it as it yeah. is you know, and, and talking it through yeah. you know so yeah. um yeah you know i think i think the, the 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 whole thing that they always say in life you know if you're in debt or whatever it is like get get a reality check on where you're at before you start worrying about where you want to get to you know so um, i wanted to i wanted to pivot because we all we all got hit with the news almost at the exact same time as we were going into lockdown that that we oh sorry before i do there's a great article by magnus haystack that i'm going to put up on the on the link and if you're watching the recording you can click on it below where he actually reviewed the different uh, not only property market but the jsc and everything over the last 10 years it makes for very interesting reading um, now again tonight is is a, is a q a um, i just put this here to remind myself so i'll put the link up in the chat box but the next question that i wanted to talk around was the impact of the downgrade junk status you know and, and whether you know whether COVID actually is just it, it's COVID such a big problem that this actually is just like another one of the problems and and if we didn't have COVID, it would be that much bigger I, what do you think i don't know again you know michelle what, what are your thoughts on on the whole junk status thing? Scott, Scott, exactly exactly that i think that it it it, it was something that we could all foresee going to happen um, at what point it was going to happen, it's been coming for the last um, three years in any event. Um, it's arrived, but I think it got um, crowded out um, because of COVID. Um, so, so actually, one of the blessings, can I say that? No, not really. <laughs> No, no. Look, I mean, it's uh, sorry. I'm just, I'm just showing people that article while you're talking. So, uh, uh, please, please keep going. Yeah. No, I mean that's that's it. That's all I've got to say about um, uh, about that. If we hadn't been hit with COVID, some of the things that we could have um, expected potentially, um, our rand dollar has uh, depreciated. Could we have seen foreign buying coming back? Um, an uptick of that. Right now, with the world in 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 turmoil, um, no one's um, no one's going to be. Um, uh, as excited to to buy foreign property in South Africa at this stage, um, so I really think that it's been drowned out um, due to due to the COVID pandemic. I, 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 I know, there's a there's a great saying I don't know if you the, you guys know it, but um, called popcorn popcorn style, and we don't need to necessarily each of us have something to say unless you unless you want to jump in. But I don't know, Andrew, what your thoughts are on uh, on the COVID thing. Oh, I think like like Michelle was saying, you know, I remember the beginning of this year having this conversation about, um, you know, when are we going to get downgraded to junk status? So, so like Michelle said, we already knew it was going to happen. The whole downgrade wasn't a surprise to anyone. I think what was a surprise is it had to have happened at the same time as COVID-19, which doesn't do anyone any favours. Um, so yes, it came with the with the interest rate drop. I mean, the base rate now is 4.25 percent. I could be wrong, Neil, but I'm sure the last time we had a base rate this low was like 1973 or something, right? Oh, right yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, and you know, fortunately for for that interest rate cut, you know, for people that are feeling a squeeze, Scott, um, you know, I think I think it is going to help the the economy too. But but to what degree? That's the thing. You know, and they always say that with an interest rate drop or an interest rate hike, it takes you like five six months until you see the impact of that change. Uh, excellent, David. Ah, uh, yeah, Scott. I can't, I can't really wait to mean to you know too much in on that. I think uh, Michelle and, and and Andrea said pretty much anything. Um, but I suppose just just from an outsider's perspective, uh, you know, I'm not a property investor, but I, you know, if I was sitting with some pounds right now, I, I think buying property in South Africa might be a, quite a good quite a good idea with the, with the, with the exchange rate. But I'm no expert on that, so I'm not going to weigh in too heavily on that, uh, Neil. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I think the downgrade is, hasn't, the, the, the effects were actually factored in, a lot of the commercial companies factored in the downgrade already. Uh, I think by the time that COVID-19 came, it, it, it was such a huge event. Well, it is a huge event. We're living it. We're in lockdown right now. So the, the impact is minuscule. So, I mean, downgrade us again, Moody's, if you want to. I mean, if you look at Brazil, Brazil has been in junk status for how many years? Yet they have had how many Olympic Games, how many Soccer World Cups, I mean, people still go there, they still travel there. So 
we've got to say, well, what is that? It's not a good place to be. I think it's really, don't invest in South African bonds. And I think if they're looking for overseas money to invest into South Africa, they're going to say, well, you know, it's junk status. How safe is your investment and how safe are your returns? So I think the one positive thing, if I could call it positive of COVID-19, it's a global pandemic. It's not only South Africa. It's a worldwide problem. And we're all sitting in the same boat. And I believe that we've all got to find the solution together, not only here in South Africa. I mean, we see our president talking to all the people around the world, asking for solutions, for money, for funding. You know, And so I think there's a lot of idea sharing. You quoted the stats, 300 million users on Zoom. I think everybody's Zooming around the world at the moment, You know, talking and finding solutions. And I think that's what we're going to do. I think this is a brand new sort of uh, thing that's hit us and, and, and we've got to sort of guide our way through this, you know, and, and, and find out where we can find, uh, you know, the right sort of ideas that can, that can get us out of this. But I think we first need to get a solution to the vaccine. You know, we need a vaccine to be able to sort out COVID-19. But so, so we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns in this whole thing and how long it's going to go on for. So I think the impact of junk status has been minuscule. Neil, so two, two quick comments from my side. One I forgot to ask you earlier. Um, when you mentioned the, the report or whatever you put together for people on, on how to deal with COVID, is that something that you'd be willing to share with people? Oh, absolutely. No, it's, it's, uh, it's on our website. It's a, it's a lockdown. No, absolutely, it's for free. And we, we actually decided we're going to do a series because we want to give people the means. We want to give them the tools. Um, to say, well, how can we deal with it? And I know that Michelle's got some you know, rental tools for distress. Will, will you either put the, the link into the chat box or send it to yeah, Lee so that yeah. you can put it in the chat box? And I if people are watching it, it will be on the, on, the, yeah. on the link below. Um, okay, yeah, so, and my second yeah. comment was just what you said. And, and, I, and I, I want to say something. I'm on a group of, of a whole bunch of entrepreneurs in England, and I was on a call with them uh, late last week, Friday night, actually. I said, for the first time in a very long time, it's awesome to be proud of your leader. And what I mean by that is if you look at the English leadership, the American leadership, and quite frankly, a lot of leadership around the world, it really has been pretty dire. And, and I really saw Robert Pause, in my opinion, has done a phenomenal job um, under very tough circumstances. So, you know, it's, I, I, again, it's just my opinion. You can love, hate me, shoot me. It doesn't matter. It's my opinion. But, but it's, it's wonderful to be proud of your leader again. And, and the world needs good leadership. So it's, I, that's just my opinion. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, no, no, it is. I mean, we can be very proud of our president. I think he's done an awesome job. And look, I mean, it's not popular decisions that you've got to make, but I think he's done it for all the right reasons. So, you know, he's looked at the situation. He kind of tackled it quite early. You know, countries like Australia, New Zealand and Taiwan have been lauded because they, you know, brought in these uh, lockdown and these measures in pretty quickly. And I, and I think you've thrown South Africa along with that. However, our economic, um, you know, situation in South Africa is, you know, we, you know, if you look in our, in our townships, we've got a lot of people that's suffering. You know, we've got 20 people in a room, and and I mean, it's when you have a pandemic like this, it's very difficult to survive it if that gets into those like, kind of areas, the sub-economic areas. So we've got our own problems of how we deal with that. I mean, they do have a plan, and I think they, I mean, they're in 200 doctors, whatever, from Cuba. So. There you go, xenophobia. Um, uh, they brought them from Cuba to help them here in South Africa, so, uh, which is fantastic. So I think there's a lot of positive initiatives which we can be very proud of um, in terms of how we've acted in that kind of stuff. Excellent. I'm just watching the time here because there's lots of uh, great questions and, and lots of millions of questions coming through. So hope you're all prepared to stay out till midnight tonight. But Andrew, from your perspective on the repo rate, you know, you've already actually referred to the repo rate coming down. Um, I think you mentioned right now it's low since 1972 or 79, etc. What's interesting to me is two questions. Do you think it's going to go lower? And if so, and well, whether it goes lower or not, how long do you think this will last for as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, eh, Scott. So, um, you know, it came down all the way down to 4.25. Do I think it'll go down again? Yes, I do. Um, there's talk of it going down, you know, 0.25, maybe 0.5 in the next few months. Will it actually happen? Well, no one's got a mirror but yes, I do think interest rates will drop again. Um, I can only give you my opinion, Scott. In, in my opinion, um, those rates are going to stay at that level for as long as they have to stay low. And, and that could be 18 months, two years, like and Neil said it. This is not going to be a quick fix. This is going to be a few years. 
So they can't put these rates down and all of a sudden lift the rates back up. Even with the Moody's downgrade, the cost of borrowing money is going to be more expensive uh, for South Africa. But in my personal opinion, uh, I'm no economist or anything like that, but you know, looking at what happened in England back in 2007, even though this is a different story, but still how property prices tanked, uh, interest rates went down, they stayed low for quite a long time. And I'm sensing to myself, you know, interest rates have dropped and I think they're going to stay low for a good few years. Um, you know, that's not great for savers. It's not great for savers at all. Interest rates drop, people saving money in the bank. That is one of the great things about South Africa. In fact, I knew, because um, I've you know, been in the UK for 15 years, and I met some guys from Europe in the UK who had cash in, in, in SA banks, saving money in our banks, because in Europe and in the UK, they're getting less than 1%. Um, but with the whole Moody's downgrade, like Michelle's saying, you know, investing into residential property, don't think that's going to happen anymore. Um, but, you know, great for when things get on, when you do get on top of things, Scott, you know, is it good for buyers, investors? Yes, it is. Um, but, you know, getting into a different question here, Scott, tonight, because I think it's relevant, you know, we talk about this is going to be great for buyers and investors with the lower interest rates. But like we've been saying, but are we going to have those tenants for those properties? Um, in which areas at what levels so I think that's something which Michelle's probably got more data or a better opinion on because this is what I'm worried about people is they're going oh there's going to be all these great opportunities out there we can buy properties uh, under market value but the question is you know are we going to still see the same yields and I guess that's up for debate and I'm sure you know Neil with your experience over the last few years and you too Scott um, you know the answer could be yes or no yeah no, look, I think it pivots quite well into, into my next question to David. And, you know, for me, it's interesting. You know, my, my first house I bought in London in 2002, I've, I've turned a three-bedroom house into a five-bedroom house, and I've never had a month's void in that property across all five bedrooms in whatever it is, 18 years. And May is the first month I've got a vacancy because uh, one of my tenants was a flight attendant, lost their job, not going to work, so they've left, they've left London completely. And in the lockdown, no one can move into the property. And I'm like, how do I solve that problem? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to do. So, yeah. you know, it's uh, in, in terms of, uh, from your perspective, David, and, you know, in, in South Africa, we've, we've had a challenge of getting tenants out anyway, uh, in good times. Now, we've, <laughs> now, you know, now we're in a very different situation where it's, you know, well, as Michelle's already pointed out, you actually can't physically move people anyway because they can't even you know get in and out of the premises um but but legally i mean where, where do you see this going i mean what what happens now like no, no I, mean, you're Scott, it's, it's... I, I fully acknowledge that i'm i'm literally asking you a, an impossible question you've already spoken about precedence and everything i appreciate that yeah look i mean where we're headed at the moment you know is anyone's guess and, you know, just, just to reiterate, you know, just maybe if I can just disclaim myself as well, is that, you know, all the advice that we're giving landlords and tenants, whether it's commercial or whether it's residential, it, it, it's all based on, on how we interpret the law as it stands at the moment. But, you know, the, the difficulty that we have is that there isn't a precedent in our law uh, to deal with the COVID-19 and to deal with a, a national lockdown. So it's very difficult to, to try and give clients certainty in these very uncertain times. And, you know, our law is basically made up of, of its, its legislation, its common law, and its precedent. And, and when you don't have a precedent to go on, and, you know, and if our common law and our legislation don't make provision for these kinds of things, it's, it's very difficult to, to sort of steer people in the right direction, which, which you believe is the right direction, and not to know how courts are, are going to deal with this thing. And, you know, it, it, it's all good and well to, to, you know, to tell a client, look, this is what the law says. But, you know, as, as soon as you start taking socioeconomic factors into account and, you know, that this is unprecedented and, you know, all sorts of things, who knows what the courts are going to do? You know, Neil, I think it was Neil who mentioned earlier, you know, about, um, you know, everyone having to come together and, you know, be, you know, all, we, you know, we're all in this together. But, you know, it's difficult because if the law says X, Y and Z, uh, unless there are compelling reasons to, to change the law or, or, or to deviate from that position, it, it's got to be X, Y and Z. Um, and as as harsh as that sounds, so really, Scott, you know, in, in these times, what what we've been saying to to residential and commercial tenants is is you know the starting point is is always the contract. So nine times out of ten, you, you're going to have a written lease agreement in place for residential and commercial. Um, 
And really, that should be the starting point for anyone who's asking questions about should I pay or shouldn't I pay. And from STBB's perspective, that, that is the advice that we're giving people from a first port of call perspective. Um, if your contract has a clause that deals with a, a, a vis mayor or a force majeure, then you know, then your answer lies in the contract. Uh, you know, just for you know, for our listeners and and, and for our viewers who, who perhaps don't know what those those phrases are, um, or a force majeure, or, you know, is something that that, that the people you know, people haven't contracted for, they, they haven't contemplated happen and it was foreseeable. It's something that happens that's outside the control, what was seen and you know it, it happens after the event. So what people are saying is that this you know this is this is what we're faced with and this is what COVID-19 is. But you know if if you want to split hairs, it's not necessarily COVID-19. It's the lockdown that's been imposed as a result of COVID-19 and, and the regulations that follow because I mean if you had to take the lockdown away it would be business as usual, albeit very recklessly, it, it, it would still be business as usual. The economy would be open and we'd be operating. So they wouldn't, you know, these questions wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be plagued with these questions. So from our perspective, it's 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 the lockdown that's been imposed and the regulations that follow the lockdown that, that is leading to these, you know, these difficulties. Um, so, you know, starting with the contract, if if you look in your contract and you find a visma your or pause majeure clause, you need to deal with it in terms of what the contract says. And guys, I'm I'm talking strictly from a legal perspective and also from a very general perspective. Obviously, each case must be dealt with on its own merits and you know and those kinds of things and everyone's circumstances are different. So what I say now is, is purely from a general perspective. Um so yeah, so that, that would be the first the starting point. If your contracts don't have such a clause in it, we're we're advising our clients landlords and tenants alike to try and accommodate each other um where possible you know obviously you know some people might rely on their rent some people might not be able to pay rent and you know the question the question that's that, that's coming up is well am i allowed to stop paying my rent and from stbb's perspective the the general approach that we've that we've taken to to these kinds of questions is that generally speaking the lockdowns or COVID-19 are not going to be seen as an impossibility of performance. So your, your force majeure your, or your, your vis majeure, which, which le le leads people to suggest that it is now impossible for me to pay my rent. I've, I've lost my job, um, I've taken a pay cut, it is now impossible for me to pay my rent. It's not impossible, it's commercially difficult, but it's not impossible. So. As harsh as that might sound, strictly speaking, that, that is how we're interpreting the law at the moment. Um, it's a little bit different in a commercial sense in that, you know, with your residential leases, you, you'll find nine times out of ten that your, your tenants are already in occupation and they're living there and they have to stay there. Um, so they're getting the full use and enjoyment of the property. In commercial, in the commercial sense, it might be slightly different in that even though your your tenants might be in the in the premises by way of you know they've they've got their furniture their equipment their goods their whatever their, their produce stored in this in this on this premises they're being prevented from accessing the premises so they they they, they can't get the full use and enjoyment of their property and in those instances perhaps a remission of rent or a reduction of rent is more suitable but in in the tenant's perspective where you're, you're in the property you're getting the full use and enjoyment of it we're saying it, it, you're not automatically allowed to withhold rent, and 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 we're advising landlords in those instances, to the extent that you can't reach a, a you know an amicable resolution by way of a, an agreement or whatever the case may be, negotiating between the parties, follow the contract. Once again, you know you send your letters of demand. I, I saw an article, I think it was released from TPN actually, to say that letters of demands have have skyrocketed. I think 30% in the last month. Um, which is encouraging from a contractual perspective. You know, I'm a, I'm a contractual lawyer, so I, I, I do hold sacred contracts that people have entered into. And, and we're saying to people, follow the contracts. You know, if, if a landlord sends out a letter of demand, it's, it's re the onus is really on the tenant to say, well, hang on, I can't pay because of X, Y, and Z. So, you know, that, that's, that's the general approach that we're taking at the moment. Um, when it comes to evictions, you know, there, there is a regulation that, that's come out, if I'm not mistaken, to say that there should be no residential evictions during COVID-19. So at the moment, 
barring the fact that you can't even get access to courts or it'll be very difficult for you to you know get an eviction application before a magistrate or a judge at this point um there is that regulation to say that there's no there's not going to be any residential evictions during this time which also leaves a you know the landlord in a very precarious position because now you know i can't evict this guy he's not paying am i going to recover from him in due course do i have to sue him in due course you know these are all the questions that come up and we're going to have to answer those questions as the lockdown eases and you know as we go through this process together these uncharted these uncharted waters so um yeah, I mean that's 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 my two cents worth on on that, Scott. Excellent, David. Well, thank you very much. And I think uh, bottom line of what I heard is uh, try to be reasonable and, and negotiate between both parties. There's actually someone who made a comment here. Uh, all mid mid sized retailers are proposing zero rental for April and turnover rental only for months from May through December. Long haul for retail landlords and for tenants. So again, I uh, just uh, yeah. So what I'd like to do is, is Neil, pivot to to yourself, and you know, if you if you look at property and, and what the fundamentals are, and just by the way, this is Neil's magazine. Um, if, if people are interested in in Remake, um, you know what the fundamentals and the statistics are telling us, and you know, should we be investing? Should we be selling? Should we be doing nothing? You know, in, in South African property at the moment, what what are your what do you think? Well, we should definitely not be doing nothing. <laughs> I think that's possibly the worst thing that you could ever do. So um, I think, you know, since we're spending a lot of time in front of our computer screens, I mean, I haven't been, I've been more busier than ever in my, <laughs> since lockdown started. Um, I have an average of probably five to six Zoom meetings a day. And, uh, and I end up doing my admin sort of into the early hours of the evening, getting up early in the mornings and that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm putting in extra hours. I seem to be working hard, but I don't seem to be getting the same returns for the hours that I've been putting. So, so from an investor perspective, obviously you can see right now that uh, you know retail property and, and certainly office office in the commercial sectors are definitely not uh, things that are on the radar screen. I, I would say for investors right now. In fact, uh, the figures that were in um, February. Uh, the office sector, I mean, was close. I mean, in Santon, it was close to 20% vacancies. In the CBD of Cape Town, I think it's around about 11%. Um, and so, yeah, the, those numbers are increasing all the time because a lot of those uh, tenants are, you know, obviously operating from home and operating remotely. And there was actually a study done quite recently of people that were uh, questioned about whether they would still operate remotely after lockdown and 73 percent said yes so people have now got a taste of working for home which if i was investing into the office sector i'd be a little bit concerned however that also could present a massive opportunity for the owner for, uh, for in the office sector they could convert all those offices into residential because i think that's definitely where the action is going to be in future um, and not right now because it, it, everything is in, in a distressful situation because people cannot work. They cannot, uh, employment figures have gone up to astronomical. I believe it's about 1.3, could be even more. And there's around about 55,000 small, medium enterprises that are in distress that could possibly be closed down if you know lockdown continues for a protected period of time, which will obviously impact right across everybody. And, uh, and and of course it won't be forever, you know. So so then of course retail. So we've seen the impact of retail. I mean, um, and and it's only really your essential services, your food retailers that can operate through this time. And uh, and we see all the moms and pops have all said, well, look, there's no ways we can actually pay our rent. And uh, and a number of other big players like Pacini Group, etc., have also said we want a reduction or significant reduction. And uh, and it's it's quite widespread. So and I mean, if you're not trading, you're not making money. You can't pay your rent. It's it kind of just has a, a, a sort of a spin off. So so just from a, just a small to, to I mean, if you look at medium to 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 longer term, possibly you know whether that will come back. I'm talking about the office sector and retail. I wouldn't touch them. Industrials seem to be quite resilient, but at the moment, obviously, they're taking a hiding because most small businesses are not operating. So it only really leaves um, residential, but it's really in the sort of the entry level because I mean, if you look at you know we've we've got you know a massive 
population that is unhoused. You know, there's a desperate need for, for housing in the in the entry level up to a million rand, and that still presents a massive opportunity. But the problem is there's not enough supply. And that's what the problem is. There's not enough supply in that sector. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's where we need to reset and we need to sort of say, well, look, why aren't we producing houses in that sector? And you speak to any developer of salt and that say it's almost impossible to, to become profitable in an affordable housing development. Um, it, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a profitable venture. So, so I think where should you be investing? I think, you know, um, we, I think people should have a little bit of a, a wait and see approach simply because they cannot transact. I definitely would not make any 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 proposals for any investments right now. Uh, I liquidated my all my assets probably eight months ago. I was smart like Ian Fife. I don't know if you remember Ian Fife Scott. He was the property editor for Financial Mail. He well, Ian, liquidated. Ian actually, Ian actually flew over with Andy McPherson and were the two keynote speakers of my first major event in London in uh, in Putney in 2004 2005. Very good man, bless his heart. He was oh, wow. an excellent investor. He sold 300 properties two months before the global financial crisis in the inner city of Johannesburg, and he cashed out very nicely. And uh, and it's even, I mean, from I learned from Dolph, who says, oh, hardly never sell, but you've got to get rid of your properties when they're just completely non-performing for a period of time. And when you get stupid offers for property, you take them and you sell them. So, um, so there was, there's also a time to buy and there's a time to sell as well. So, but I think the buying spree is going to come back and uh, I think there's going to be massive distress in the next year in the residential sector, which means that there's going to be massive opportunities that are going to be presented and there's going to be a lot of bargaining. And uh, I think we were talking a little bit about earlier, should we buy, should we sell, should we hold, but some people can't afford to hold. So they pretty much have to get rid of it and, 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 and sometimes it's not a bad idea, depending, of course, how big your portfolio is. I had to do it in 2009. I had to liquidate some really good assets to pay for the bad ones that I had to get rid of. So um, after the global financial crisis. So I literally had to get rid of more than half of my portfolio. And, uh, and it's pretty much the same thing. I think if once we come out of this and once we see this, I think, you know, we, we, we could see a massive boom if we get it right. And, uh, and, uh, and I think South Africa, we, we mentioned earlier about this junk status thing. I think we might have even dodged the bullet because if we, were ex we weren't exposed by COVID-19 as, as the rest of the world are, we probably could have been in South Africa. And I'm not talking about other countries, could have been in serious, serious, serious problems. And now we're really, you know, we're in with the rest of the crowd. Um, so yes, so to answer your question, it's, it's residential is going to make a massive comeback. I think there's going to be a lot of conversions of old office buildings into residential and uh, and I, I think that's where the opportunity is going to be. But I think you need to assess because there's going to be a lot of bargains coming up within the next few months. Don't, don't be so quick on the draw, guys. I would hang back a little bit because first of all, your offer cannot be accepted. Let's hold on because the price could drop between now and the time that it's accepted. So I wouldn't get that <laughs> be so fast on the draw on that one. Michelle, I want to I want to pivot to yourself, and uh, the question I wanted to ask you was I was fascinated by a presentation you actually gave at Neil's event, which feels like months ago, but believe it or not, it was like six weeks ago <laughs> when when you and Neil were all in uh, Cape Town together. But before yeah. before I ask you in terms of where we're going, I just wanted to share with you quickly. Um, I there's a guy called Roger Hamilton. I was on a webinar with him last week, and I can share these links with people. But if you look here, this was in America. 31% of people can't pay rent. Um, so let me just quickly. I just want to jump through a whole bunch of articles here that uh, for people. This one was one third of Americans missed their rental payments in April, and um, credit defaults in China. So I think to your point, Neil, you know, global consumer default wave in China. It, this is not just a South African problem. Debt, uh, credit defaults. Uh, in, yeah. in, in happening around the world, uh, consumer mm. debt uh, beginning in China, um, exaggerates household debt. So there's there's an amazing 22 million Americans filed for unemployment. Uh, the impact that it's having in uh, in in different countries, um, back from the UK to Australia to South Africa, um, <clears throat> the unemployment in the US and the UK been worse than the Great Depression. Uh, unemployment to 10% in Australia. 
a home limit is braced for 15 mortgage, million mortgages that, uh, that can't come through. This one was quite interesting. We were talking about commercial, and this actually was saying that 85% of commercial landlords in America are saying that they, uh, that they won't be paying rent. Uh, department stores, which what you just said, Neil, uh, retail is, is, uh, is a really tough place at the moment. Um, the impact it could have on Africa as a whole, uh, what's been happening with capital flows, um, the global debt uh, world may face double recession. So there's, there's some really good reports here that, that I got from him that I'm happy to share with uh, people, um, you know, just in terms of all these different links. But the why, why I wanted to to really, Michelle, pivot to yourself is that what I tend to find in, in these times is we all get caught up in the hype. Uh, we get caught up in the emotion and we, you know, we, we read all these news articles and, and everything else. And what I've always appreciated is people like yourself have long-term trends, stats, and data, which ultimately allows us to, you know, make, make intelligent decisions, you know, from, from the research to the data, you know, et cetera. And so what I, what I wanted to, to try and um, ask from yourself is that you said, and I'm going to paraphrase what you said, what I heard you say in March at Neil's event was that the stats already, and this was before coronavirus, we were even talking about. We were talking about a world economic slowdown. We were talking about South African economy in trouble. And you said, you know, South African residential property, it's, it's, I'm using my own words now, but it was something like it's a tough gig at the moment. And, and I can't remember the exact words you used. And, and then since those six or seven weeks ago, we've now been hit by, by Corona on top of that. Where to from here? Sure. So, you know, we look at, um, we've looked at the good standing and that's your, your third of tenants who, who aren't paying at the moment. Um, the reality for landlords is you either want to make money with capital appreciation or you want to make money out of your um, income uh, uh, yields. You had a slide up right at the beginning, Scott, which spoke to the EBSA house price index, where real house price growth has been negative um, since the global financial crisis. The reality is that that's, that's, a, that's a national stat. It's not a stat that um, is indicative of every single property in the country. So even up until 2018, the Western Cape was bouncing along. That's the one I was talking about. The Western Cape was bouncing along at double digit um, house price inflation. The Atlantic seaboard was sitting at 33% in 2018. So when you look at the data, it's about looking at not just the national stats, but it's about identifying where the opportunities are. I'm going to give you some examples. So when we look at uh, yield data, the income data, what we're looking at, um, the, the, the gross yield rather, Scott, what we're looking at there is what is the value of the property and what is the value of the annualized value of the rent. Um, and that gives, us, that gives us the yield. So what TPN does is we take the entire deeds database, we get an average price uh, index for every single property in South Africa, we then overlay that with the rental price, and we work out what the annualized rent is um, on a per property basis. Divide the rent by the market value, and that gives you a yield on a per property basis. You can then take that data and you can start on looking at it intelligently. What does sectional title look at versus full title? So we know pre-COVID, sectional title was yielding us 10.5%, um, and full title properties were yielding us 7.8%. Um, you take that data and you say, okay, well, what does a three-bedroom look like versus a two-bedroom versus a one-bedroom? And we can tell you two years ago, a one-bedroom was yielding you better than a, than a two-bedroom, but now in the last two years, because... Um, single uh, bedroom units, the, the market value has increased more than the two bedroom units, a two bedroom unit is yielding uh, you more. We take Gauteng and we say, well, what is Gauteng yielding us on average? 10.9% versus the Western Cape, which is 7.79%. So you take your different areas, you take your different properties and you find where the pockets of excellence are. So here's the thing right now. Right now, we know we're going to see price deflation, uh, market market value um, uh, drop off. It just has to happen. We're going to see properties coming back onto the market simply because people cannot afford um, uh, to pay the bonds. And that's both on primary residents and on people that own multiple properties. As Neil said, people are going to be forced, sellers, on some of their portfolio to retain um, other of their um, uh, uh, property portfolio. So it's about the research right now in the current market, not just what is the value of the property, what can I pick up, what is a steal, 
what is the value of the rent going to be going forward? Because that's the other thing. Rental price has been escalating at 2-3% for the last 6-7 years. We have not been seeing double digit um, escalations. We've been seeing barring the Western Cape. The Western Cape, up until 2018, we were seeing good um, escalations. But for the rest of the country, two, three percent um, escalations. If, and, and, and I disagree a little bit, Neil, with the fact that we've got a, uh, we don't have enough uh, supply of, of property stock. In different segments of the market, we have different supply um, uh, dynamics, um, uh, demand supply dynamics. So in the mid-tier markets, Properties between, say, the four and a half to 10,000 Rand value. We actually, in certain areas, we have an oversupply um, of property in those, in those markets. And that's because we've had a lot of development in the 2019 period, where a lot of the um, institutional investors came on and uh, were building uh, big rental portfolios, bringing big uh, developments on stream all at the same time driving prices down as a result of that um, and um, um, and so we actually have an oversupply of properties in your major metro areas in your uh, middle income uh, categories where we have an undersupply of properties in, is in your below four and a half thousand rand um, properties but here it becomes more risky your yields are better but your risk is higher because your risk of non-payment and defaults um, is higher as well so it's about understanding the different segments of the market, the different uh, demographics of the market, and picking up um, uh, properties that are right now, if, you, if, you, if you're looking at investing, um, it's about understanding where those opportunities are, because opportunities are going to pre present themselves in the next couple of months. Michelle, I love what you're saying, and I love the way you talk around using the data and, and looking for pockets of excellence and what is the value of the rental going forward. You know, it's, it's one of the things that I believe so strongly in is that most people make investments based on gut feel. And actually, they, you know, the data's out there now. No one's got an excuse. They've just got to use the data to make more informed decisions. And, and it's for me, it, it is quite exciting. So I'm going to ask some questions now. There's going to be nothing that people need to see on the slides. But I, I actually just wanted to gather people's feedback in terms of, so, you know, my, 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 I encourage you to, to get involved and give your opinion in terms of the data and the questions that we're asking. So the current poll that I'm asking is, do you think South African property is a good investment? And while we are going to pivot to the next question, I'm not sure, David, if you'd be the best uh, person to speak to this or, or who might be, I don't know, Andrew or Neil or, or, or even yourself, Michelle, but someone said, what about rental insurance? And it's quite interesting because I didn't think about that. You know, if, if I've got rental insurance now and my tenant's not paying, where I sit in terms of everything you've discussed with force manure and everything else. Um, I don't know if anyone's got mm. a comment. I've got no idea, but but it's an interesting question around rental insurance. Yeah, Scott, I can, so I, I can just... Okay, Michelle, you go ahead. Um, uh, just because, Scott, we, we work quite closely with a company called uh, Rentmaster, who's a, a rental guarantee uh, uh, product. And I do know that um, at the moment they are battling with um, exactly the same thing as, as the rest of the market um, is battling with. And um, although they have force majeure in their agreements, they are not, um, they are not implementing those um, at the moment. What they're doing at the moment, um, similar to what the rest of the market is doing, is negotiating with the tenant and the landlord and finding a um, an outcome that is um, is something that both the landlord and the tenant uh, can work with. Things like entering into deposit utilization agreements, deferred rental agreements, not running debit orders, um, at the same time honouring their agreements with their landlords in terms of their um, in terms of their um, um, guarantees. And one of the problems with the guarantees at the moment, as you know, and as um, as Dave suggested, is that there's a moratorium on evictions. So it's very difficult to continue to honour a guarantee where you cannot proceed with legal process um, and evict the tenant um, and continue to 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 honour. So I do know that Redmaster, um, because they're one of our clients, uh, we've dealt quite closely with 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 them at the moment. Andrew, sorry, you had something to say there? That wasn't me, eh? I think it was David. Oh, sorry. Oh, it was David, sorry, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, Scott, I, I was just going to weigh in there just before we moved on to that, um, to this topic. I just wanted to say one of the things that people should also consider not to throw a spanner in the works, you know, when, when considering investing and with the data that Michelle gave is also just to think, you know, if, if in the worst case scenario, I mean, it's, it's not good to think doom and gloom, but I suppose it is, it is always good to have all your, all your chickens in a row is to think that, you know, if, if the worst case scenario does hit you and you do have to, you know, eventually resort to litigation and you, and you do have to try and A, evict this, this, this squatting tenant and B, also try and recover a rear rental. What are the prospects uh, of recovery going to be? So, you know, when you're choosing the kind of property that you want to invest in and in the, in the kind of target market that you want to hit and the kind of tenant that you want to place in, in, in your property, you know, the, these are the kinds of things that investors should also just be aware of. You know, you, you know if, if you do have to go the legal route, what, what are the chances that you are going to actually um, re recover from this tenant? Um, from the rental insurance perspective, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult, you know, and once again, in, in these uncharted waters with, with regards to the law and how the law is going to be applied, you know, even, even though we have a moratorium on, on evictions, my, my interpretation of that is that you may not, you, you may not, obtain an eviction order against someone or or if you do have an eviction order that's in place the the sheriff is not going to act upon that order but scott that that's not to say that lease agreements can't be cancelled during this time you know which which ultimately leads to an eviction in due course so you might find that there are instances where a tenant uh, where a tenant has fallen into arrears um, they refuse to pay or, or they haven't been able to pay and and the landlord has taken the hard approach and they said well you know I'm enforcing a contract I'm putting you in breach I'm giving you 20 business days to rectify and if you don't I'm going to cancel and once they've cancelled they cancel that that agreement is then you know is a nullity uh, and then you have to in due course you know once presumably once uh, lockdowns are eased or, or once we we get to a stage where we can access courts they are going to be facing those those consequences. Um, so it's not to say that just because there's a moratorium, you know, consequences aren't going to flow. I think people should just be mindful that consequences are still going to flow. Um, but it it we we're going to have to sort of wait and see how the courts are going to apply these things moving forward after lockdown, or, or at least you know after some of these restrictions have been eased as well. Oh, perfect. So I want to I want to pivot to the next question and maybe start with yourself, Andrew, here. But you know, in terms of property coaching and what you're teaching people both in South Africa and in England, you know, what, what do people do at the moment? You know, Neil gave his opinion of, of the different sectors that we should be looking at. Michelle's given us some of the data. David's given us, you know, again, some of the legal things that we need to take into account. But from your perspective, you know, what what do people do? You know, what what are you know, what, what are some of the wealthiest yeah, people doing? What can we copy from wealthy people, et cetera? And absolutely. I mean, I think for me, Scott, I've always invested for cash flow. Um, you know, back in London 2005, the first thing I was taught, Andrew, go out, invest for cash flow. And if you get capital growth, it's a cherry on the top. And I think these times are, are saying that now, right? People could be equity rich, but it means nothing for having that cash flow. So what we teach at the Property Academy, the people that do want to take um, advantage, the people that do that do want to spot those opportunities. You know, what we teach is when we get into a property deal, be it in the UK or here in South Africa, are we, are we, are we investing into a positive cash flow and pro, a cash flowing property? What I, I think my advice to people now, you know, if we are investing here in South Africa, um, um, and, and Michelle said it, you know, I do believe that there is a market below the 1 million Rand market. However, that there are bigger risks with that. So all we need to do as investors, is where we have, uh, I call it a slush fund. So the income comes in, we have our expenses. I've always got a percentage for a slush fund for non-payers, for voids, for general maintenance. Is, you know, when you're running your numbers on a specific property deal, I would now be a bit more conservative. i put a higher percentage for voids. Um, I'd be conscious that you've got to be more, um, more on top of your tenants. The management has to be a lot slicker. Um, and you've got to, and, and like Neil said, you know, uh, plan for the worst. But um, where I do agree with Michelle is that, and I, and I hate to say this, but 
unfortunately, we are going to see opportunities. And, you know, I've dealt with so many sellers, Scott, in, in the UK, in the north of England, about three hours north of, of London, um, and here in the East Rand of Johannesburg. And the reality is, is that if us as investors don't help certain people, the only alternative is bankruptcy. And these people will go through the share of auctions. And, you know, I bought before, during, and after an auction here in South Africa. And it's, and it's not a nice thing. So, you know, what we teach at the Property Academy is how do we help these people move on? How do we stop that repossession? How do we unlock the equity for the seller and then help them move on? with the clean slate um, and so and so my my teaching has always been the same scott when we look at at property or real estate um and this is only my opinion how can we generate a high cash flow high yield and like we all said the problem is that the higher yielding properties are found the high cash flow properties do tend to be um in areas where they might where there may be slightly you know higher risk but you know higher risk is okay if you know how to manage that risk if you know how to manage that property um and, and i think that's my take on that hey scott is get the right education understand do you want to do resident um, you know students accommodation multi-lets are very popular but you know higher management do you want to do standard buy to that property i think before people just go out there and go buy you know any of property they really need to understand what their strategy is what are they really going out to buy? Are they looking for 20 properties, 10 properties, five properties? Are they chasing cash flow? Do they want to diversify, you know, with yourself, Scott, into America, Australia, or the UK? So my view is, you know, for the next month, for, for the next month or two, um, reflect on where you are, get a plan in place, uh, make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into, understand what can go wrong. Um, and once you're at that level of confidence or knowledge, then you know take action and, and and go buy a property i think that i think that's you know i've uh, i quite like what you said there andrew and i think you know i've, I've said to a lot of people we're in lockdown i must admit i'm really struggling as we're now nearly going into our fifth week and i i was joking with uh with michelle earlier before everyone else arrived i might be mahatma gandhi on uh, on friday if they don't let me start doing exercise and stuff with unviolent protest but my point being is that you know during during these times you know you can actually use it to unlock your mind get edgy you know neil mentioned digital education webinars i applaud everyone that's online tonight because if you can unlock your mind then you can unlock your freedom you know five ten years from now and so you know i just I, it's a different perspective on the way of, of looking at it i am i am asking these polls and i'm doing it specifically because i'd love to see what people's opinions is the one thing i back you up on what you've said andrew that i learned the most from the last crash is that middle class and professional people focus on capital growth and really wealthy people focus on on income and and to your point michelle it's you know what what you said yeah what is the value of the rental income going forward it's all going well if on paper it says 10 percent what is it actually going to pay you know how sustainable is it you know and 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 uh, etc and you know i'm not going to talk about that so much tonight but that's certainly been my biggest learning lesson which sectors are going to have the most predictable income going forward and i think what's interesting is that you see a flight of capital from around the world moving to those sectors those countries those asset classes and even those currencies uh, to, to many many perspectives so neil i wanted to ask you the next question and i am conscious of time all of your time that it is your uh, freedom day evening and your husbands and wives and families are, are waiting for you and, and by the way we've had um just to put it in perspective here, we've had 111 questions as well. So I'm trying to look through and pick them up as, as per where we go. Uh, Neil, in, in terms of the global economy, I've showed some very outlandish comments that, that Roger sent through, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. Um, Roger was trying to show people what's happening with consumer debt, what's happening with global economies, what's even happening with sovereign debt. But you know, what's your take, Neil, on, on, on global economies and, and where you see them going over the next couple of years? I know you've done quite a bit with, with Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, et cetera, and, and his take on, you know, what's happening, et cetera. Yeah. Well, Scott, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you, you're suffering so badly in this lockdown. I'm happy to send you a six pack of beer. Only problem is I cannot get a courier to send it through to you. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, the only thing I will tell you is that as much as I like our president, I didn't listen to the panic purchase part, so I do have plenty of parcel <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Yeah, Scott, so I think, look, um, how do we look at the world globally? Um, I think we just have to go back probably a couple of months because we can't look at the current conditions of, of anything at the moment because 
if you switch on to CNN Crisis News Network, uh, Crisis News Network, you can see, you know, there's pandemonium and it's driven obviously from the top from, from Donald Trump. And what I'm really trying to say is America has always been a very solid market and, you know, first world market. The UK is all, they're always, they're always going to be good markets. They just got good fundamentals. And um, so does the UK. And I think, um, and Andrew as, a, as an investor there understands it. And I still think that those opportunities will always be there. Um, I think that, you know, we, we've got to look at the world in terms of where they all are in terms of growth. So obviously in terms of emerging markets, when, when we do see things turning and that the banks start, you know, opening up the taps in South Africa, um, we'll probably see people from, from overseas wanting to invest in the Atlantic seaboard again and, uh, and to, to bring money back into to South Africa because I think there's going to be, you know, a huge price cut, as Michelle said, and, uh, you know, there's going to be a repricing, a resetting, I think, of the market, both in terms of property prices and also in terms of uh, rentals. And I think there's similar things are going to happen in, in, in countries like the United States and, and the UK as well. And uh, so I think it's going to be very interesting to see how it all turns out. So I, I would say that your traditional markets, your the US, the UK have always been good markets. And I think, you know, we just look at the regulation that controls them. Um, and they, it would always be on an investor sort of, um, on, on the indicator to start looking offshore. Now, we also know that, you know, a lot of the rich companies here in South Africa have uh, been very successful in Eastern Europe. Um, now, all of a sudden, I think a lot of them have uh, also been hit by the fact of a lot of retailers, because uh, that's where most of them invest is in retail shopping centers overseas, and, and they also under severe pressure in, in those markets as well. So, um, so and, and in fact, that saved a lot of the South African REIT companies for a good number of years. But now we find that all of them are sitting in the same position. But that's COVID-19. So that's an unusual business uh, situation that's, that's cr crashed the market, put us into crisis, uncertainty, uh, not knowing what the next move is. So, so, so absolutely. I, I think from an you've got to, you just got to do your homework. It doesn't matter, you know, where you are in the world. You can, you can, what suburb you're operating in, you can still find the best deal. Um, it doesn't matter where you are. You just got to have the network. You just got to have the know-how. And Andrew also teaches a lot of that now, how to find those properties. Because uh, what we want to try and do as investors is to try and beat the averages. So a lot of the averages that we're hearing is obviously what you know Michelle has shared with us. And uh, so, so if you're a really good investor, you're going to find a deal that beats the averages by three or four or five or even 20 percent, which which is possible. And and that's just being you know, having the ability to hustle. Um, there are other quicker ways like your investment option as well, Scott, to look at offshore markets. And, uh, and it's very popular, it's almost like armchair investing where you would select and you would put it in front, not select, rather give the option to the investor of, uh, of investing in whether it is in a medical building or um, whatever, a, a care building in the UK, whatever it may be. So, so I don't think that will ever go. I think we're living in a global village now. Um, and uh, from an investment, you know, we, we, we touch each other in many ways, whether it's through technology um, or, or where we used to fly. Remember those days, we used to fly to other countries. <laughs> Not many of us do that. Well, we won't be able to, I think, for this year. So anybody's planning to go on an overseas holiday this year, don't go, you know, just Zoom rather. In fact, uh, a new thing on Zoom is they have Zoom socials where you can have a beer together and have a bra and have a chat. So, uh, so I think this, this is how we get to do <laughs> in my usual teammates, like uh, it's the easiest way. It used to be weddings and, and, and now it's Zoom hookups, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I'm conscious of time here. I want to I want to move on. Uh, just just one thing that I think to what to what you've said and, and picking up is that <clears throat> you know people people are moving towards income. In fact, one of the people on this group actually mentioned that in South Africa they're a developer and they've sold seven units uh, this month because of um, the income um, potential of it. So just, just interesting, um, where people are looking for actual tangible income. You know, as you mentioned, Neil, medical has been very attractive and continues to be attractive during these times. 
aged care has, has done really well in aging populations, residential. So it's getting different sectors. But you know, the purpose of tonight was not to go through that, although I can talk through that in a lot more detail in, in other webinars. And we are going to just ask two more questions and then I'm actually going to ask each of you to finish off with your with your top tip. And also if people want to know more, because Andrew, people are asking, how did I get your training? Michelle, people are saying, how do I get the stats? David, I've got a thousand questions here on can I sue this person? Can I sue that person? Can I not pay my rent? Which, uh, you know, obviously we, we don't want to ask, you know, each person individually. And Neil, many people are asking how they can get your data research, magazines, et cetera, et cetera. As, as you can hopefully see, all four people that, that we've invited, including ourselves, have a plethora of information that we want to share. And, and you know, 90 minutes is just too short, quite frankly, to be able to do it. So I wanted to just ask, um, the last thing that, that I think I wanted to talk about before we move into sort of the options and where the world was going, was just what does debt deflation mean and possibly even hyperinflation? And um, this is a picture from uh, the early 1930s in Germany where they, where they took the date marks and they weren't worth anything, so they made them into cuts. And uh, I just wanted to, to ask any of you, and we don't have to ask everyone if, if you don't know or are not comfortable, but you know, there's there is this talk of of where we're going to the world. Andrew, you mentioned you know we're not getting any interest on money in banks. There's a very valuable uh, TED talk I would recommend by Ray Dalio, who's one of the most respected people I respect um, in terms of you know he's got a great book called Principles, and um, you know he says putting your money in the bank is actually the worst place, which I find really intriguing uh, right now. So yeah, any comments? Um, I don't know if you want to go in the same order or popcorn style, but I'd just love to know what your thoughts are. On, uh, on whether you think this is a hundred year ago problem or whether it's a problem we might see again in the future. So I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, right, right now, um, we've spoken about um, we've spoken about escalation from a from a rental a rental price perspective, and I mentioned that it's been very low at two three percent. To be honest, I, I don't see that we're going to see hyperinflation from a uh, from a rental perspective. Um, unless we can produce smaller properties for people to downscale. What we've been seeing over the last four or five years is, is downscaling. People are moving down the property ladder into smaller, more affordable type, uh, type properties, even with escalations at only 2-3%. From an investor perspective, what we're seeing, though, is property expenses, particularly your um, um, your utility charges, your municipal charges, sewerage, refuse charges, those have all been running at double digits, um, double um, inflation uh, charges. And I guess that's where you could see the, the hyperinflation. Uh, the problem with that is, from an investor perspective, is that the, the landlord simply becomes the conduit to collect those charges on behalf of the municipality through the tenant and pass them on. So effectively crowding out the ability for investors to be able to increase their, their rental prices. Um, and I, I think that's that's a real problem for investors because it just eats away any form of, um, of, of income, um, of profit on, that, um, on, on those properties. Excellent, thank you, Michelle. Anyone else wanna give it a go? Yeah, I think on the same page as you, Michelle, I couldn't see any. I can't see any hyperinflation, and, and and what Michelle was saying. If you think about what I was taught, Scott, in 2005, invest in the property that the average man will always be able to afford. And Michelle, you said people are downsizing, right? They're going down to a two bed or a three bed, a small property where the expenses will be slightly lower. But I guess, Scott, this is a time for you know for 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 our fellow South Africans to understand that this isn't how property works in the UK or America. For example, in the UK, ladies and gents. Um, the landlords don't pick up the bill of the of, of the local council uh, rates um, and the electricity and all of that. All those, all the costs are passed over to their tenants. So I really think, Scott, this is the time when um, South African investors do need to look at other markets. Yes, I, I will continue to invest here in South Africa, but really understand what's happening in America and uh, and the UK. And that's one of the reasons, Scott, why why I want to work with you as well now is to actually diversify. Um, and start getting some of my rents into other markets. I think, thanks, uh, Andrew. Uh, Neil or David? Yeah, look, I think if we go back to the sort of the time of the Great Depression and, and, and some people are actually saying, because that's really what happened, we, the, the market went into absolute deflation. We also saw just after the Second World War, 
you know, that Germany was, you know, what money was worth. People were bringing wheelbarrows of cash um, to buy a loaf of bread, for example. And uh, so we're seeing sort of, you know, I don't think we're going to see similarities to that at all. Um, I, I just think that this, this scenario is, it's, it's, it's probably comparable to the Spanish flu that was also in about 1913, over just over 200, over 100 years ago. So, um, so yeah, I don't think so. I, th I think that it, it, when it does come back, I think there's going to be a lot of negotiation. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of interaction between people to collectively come up with a solution here. Um, these bailouts, we've heard of the 500 uh, billion bailout from our president. And I think there's going to be a lot of bailout cash that's going to sort out the, the hyperinflation story. And I think we've learned from the past. And uh, so, um, yeah, there's all kind of these, these relief programs for small businesses, for individuals, uh, UIF, whether it's working or not, whether the money is going to get to the people, I don't know, but I think it will eventually, because uh, it seems to have come from good intentions. So um, I, I, think, I think over a period of time, I just think we are in for a little bit of stress over the next uh, six months to a year or so and even longer, possibly 18 months. Uh, I think, but certainly when that turns, I think um, we're gonna probably be, you know, it's probably gonna be a massive opportunity for us to get involved in. So I don't see us going into to a massive hyperinflation scenario. I think uh, bailouts will sort of help us partly, it's been announced all the time. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's gonna turn into that scenario. Thanks, Neil. David? Yeah. Scott, uh, yeah, maybe I, I'd actually just like to bounce uh, something off Michelle to just get her thoughts on this. It's not necessarily maybe a hyperinflation issue, but maybe just some of the knock-on effects and, and maybe just some of the the, the the hidden costs, if I can call it that, for moving forward for for people like uh, homeowners associations and sectional title schemes. You know, you, you, you're talking about your your rates and your electricity and, and those kinds of things hitting double di double figures. M Michelle, what do you think about the the, the knock-on effects of, of COVID-19 from, from a sanitation perspective on, on body corporate levies and homeowners association and levies and things like that, probably going to be passing those costs on, on onto their, their residents and their homeowners. So we track a levy payment profile similar to what we do on the, on the uh, rental payment profile. We track levy payment profile on how um, um, property owners pay their levies. What we have seen in the past, pre-COVID-19, is that they track quite similarly to our rental payment profile. So rental payment profile, as I said, was sitting at around about 81, 82%. Levy payment profile was sitting at around about 83%. So very, very similar. It was fascinating, though, to watch that um, owner-occupied properties track lower and um, tenanted properties track higher. So people that are investors that are renting their properties out, that rely on the rental income, um, are more inclined to pay their levy than the, um, than the owner-occupied properties. Right now, as it stands, um, we're sitting at 64% good standing on levies and 25% in the did not pay category at the moment. That is massive for April. Mm. For April. Mm. Sure, I, um, I I could go on all night uh, in terms of all these questions. Uh, there's some brilliant questions coming through as well. So uh, I'm I am conscious of, of all your time though. There was a question that came through around uh, Rand and where it was going. I think uh, I think a couple of things that I'd like to say. Uh, the first thing is that everything we've said tonight is just our opinions. We're not giving financial advice, and uh, you know, so it's very important that everyone takes that in context. And in the same way. You know, I, I certainly am no currency expert, and I wouldn't expect anyone here to be a currency expert. Um, and and that's why I actually avoided this this topic because there is a person we've worked with, and and I've worked with for more than ten years, and and he's been highly effective at, at telling people. We did a webinar about three weeks ago, so you can ask for the recording of that, and we will be doing another webinar because normally I only do a webinar with him. Neil's done plenty with me and him. Um, only every like three to six months because it's not that relevant. But at the moment, the world changes every like three weeks. So we would we would need to need to come to. It. I want to pivot to the last question uh, for for all four of you, and it's you know most of us are actually investors. Most of us are are very like what you said, Neil, um, uh, Andrew, and Michelle, and I presume probably exactly the same for you, David, and myself. We all started investing. Most of us have been in the game for longer than ten years. 
And, uh, and it's not about how long we've been in the game. My question is that we're in the game. Uh, or my point is that we're in the game. And what I wanted to ask you was, based on everything that's happening at the moment, what's your top tip for South African investors? And, and, and also, how can they find out from you um, more information should they, should they want to go ahead? Should we go in the same order, Michelle? Do you mind if we start with yourself? With, with pleasure. I'm, I'm happy. So um, at, at the moment, I would squeeze every ounce of profit out of my investment. And that is both um, having an understanding of what the value of my rental property is worth, um, understanding that I'm not leaving any money on the table, um, making sure that I've um, produced any um, escalation that is available to me, um, pass on all the charges that you are able to pass on to your tenants uh, within the terms of your lease agreement. So your utility charges, your water charges, your sewage charges, your refuse charges, whatever charges and usage charges that you have that you can pass on to your tenant, make sure that you're passing on to them. Understanding that um, um, your charges are being, um, that you receive from your, your, your municipal charges, your utility charges are actual um, readings and not um, estimate readings. And because that's when things start to, to unwind as well. So making sure that your maintenance is up to date and you haven't left it um, for too long a period because then uh, your, your maintenance costs um, increase as well. Ensuring that your tenants that you place are quality tenants and right now you have what you have. So right now you're in a position, you've got what you've got, you're at the rental that you're at, you've got the maintenance at the level that you've got it at and you're dealing with a tenant who may or may not have an income at the moment. If that's the situation that you're in, communication is your next um, key. Ensuring that you're communicating with your tenants, if your tenant is um, faced with uh, loss of earnings, what alternative solutions are you presenting to your tenant in order to um, create some form of liquidity? So we're suggesting the deposit utilization agreement so that you have liquidity coming out of the trust um, and into the, the property rental. If you're dealing with your, um, your property expenses, your mortgages, your levies, et cetera, and where you're not, uh, you don't have Andrew slush fund and you don't have the tenants uh, making payments, then you need to be communicating and entering into negotiations with your credit providers. Because if you don't enter into those negotiations and you don't enter into your deferment agreements or your payment holidays, your credit profile is going to be updated to reflect non-payment and you don't want that. So you enter into all the credit providers um, including the credit bureaus, have ways of dealing with ensuring that payment holidays, deferment agreement, deposit utilization agreements, when entered into correctly, will not affect your credit profile um, going forward. Awesome. And, and Michelle, just quickly, if anyone wants to reach you or find you, how do they find you? Easy, michelle at tpn.co.za. So that's the normal spell. Oh, you've got it up there on the screen. So it's michelle at tpn.co.za or simply um, on our website, tpn.co.za. And don't confuse Dickens with Pickens, no, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go to, to you, Andrew. Uh, I've got your slide up. Yeah, sure, nice one. So I think, Scott, for me, it's for the existing investor, or for the investors out there that do have property, um, you know, at the end of last year, we were talking about, you know, let's set our goals for 2020, what do you want to achieve? And then bang, this comes in and, and hits us in the face, right? So what we do with a lot of our students at the Property Academy is really looking at, you know, where are you today? What does your current portfolio look like? Um, is it performing? Um, you know, because a lot of investors that, that we do work with, often when we look at the property they have purchased, um, in a lot of cases, negative cash flow properties, properties in areas where there's no capital growth is, you know, review your existing portfolio and challenge yourself, is it really working? Do you want to keep this property in your portfolio? And my advice is, um, and I always say this, you know, understand what the different options in the property industry are. You know, spend a bit of time and money on investigating what they are and then choose one specific path and become the expert at it. Um, and for the beginners out there, and like Neil was saying, you know, tread with caution. Will there be opportunities? Of course there's going to be opportunities. 
but don't think it's as easy as just going out into the field and buying any odd property. So Scott, it so happens that I've actually got, uh, there's two events this week actually. On Wednesday evening is the Asset Property Investors Network event. Uh, that's, you know, that's a national platform where we've got national investors across South Africa, um, you know, where we've got Mohammed Gadi talking about students' accommodation. Uh, we've got the head of a um, head of the campus accommodation from Vitz University. Uh, there we go, the Mr. Maguena talking around what's actually happening with student accommodation and the and the, the e-learning uh, 9 April May, which is which is very informative. And then on Saturday, Saturday is a workshop for anyone that's got one or more properties that really wants to review their current portfolio and look at where they are now, um, run the numbers with them and look at where they want to go and start and start resetting their property goals for the next 24 months. Um, so that's how, so I guess, I mean, Scott, you've got it there. If, if, they, if they go to the propertyacademy.co.za, um, it'll say the virtual uh, or wealth builder workshop. Well, I, I think I'm um, wondering, so what, uh, so what Lee, uh, what, um, uh, not, this, not, not Michelle Dickens, but uh, Michelle who works with you and Lee, uh, she's actually sent everything. So Lee's going to post everything in the chat room if people want it and all people are watching the recording can go to the link below. Uh, same for Michelle. We'll, we'll do the same for you, Michelle, uh, with your, with your links. Cool. Awesome. David. Cool. Thanks. Oh, fantastic, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for having us. And um, I just think if, if, if I have a takeaway message um, for any, any, any property investors out there, um, I think perhaps just from a legal perspective, is always just to be mindful that uh, you enter into very, very good contracts, guys. You know, there's if there's one thing that I've learned in my business is that, you know, people people do try and take shortcuts and they do try and skimp uh, on, on things like contracts. But, you know, ultimately when, when your back's up against the wall, you really need that document to not only protect you, but, you know, if, if you're a tenant to protect yourself as a tenant as well. So my advice would be to, you know, to consult an attorney, get a proper document drawn up or, you know, or even TPN, get a proper lease agreement drawn up, um, make sure that your, that your rights are protected uh, and that there is certainty moving forward in, 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 the, in the properties that you are investing in and, and renting out. You know, lit litigation, unfortunately, in South Africa is, is not a cheap exercise. Um, and when you're investing in property, th there is always the risk that you're going to have to get involved in litigation in some form or another whether it's to evict a tenant or whether it's to recover uh, to recover arrears from a tenant, both of those processes are, are, are time consuming and unpleasant. So try and protect yourself as much as possible, get the contracts drawn up uh, and, and make sure that you, you know, you, you're doing things uh, above board. Um, just, just in so far as the, the, the current lockdown period is concerned, guys, um, if I can just give a message, Try and try and be understanding with each other. Uh, we're you know we're all in difficult times and and people are struggling to pay. People have legitimately lost jobs. People have legitimately taken pay cuts. As a landlord, trying to be understanding, trying to accommodate your tenants. You know ultimately COVID-19 will pass. And if your tenant has been a good tenant up until now, if they've paid regularly, if they've looked after your premises, you know they've preserved your assets. You know, try and accommodate them because moving forward, you want those kinds of tenants in your in your property. So you know, try and assist them now, and perhaps you'll you'll reap the rewards later. Um, as I, as we said in the beginning, I, I'm based in our Cape Town branch. Um, we do have national national branches in in Johannesburg, East London, and Cape Town. Uh, I'm in the CBD um, branch in Cape Town. Uh, you can reach me on uh, my email. Is my first name David, and then the initial T for Thompson. And then at stbb.co.za, uh, or you can visit us at our website, simply stbb.co.za. Thanks, Scott. Thanks so much, David. And Neil, from your perspective. Yeah. So look, I think it's it's tough times all around, and I think um, you know I would definitely follow you know Michelle's advice in terms of if you own a bunch of properties is to you know to negotiate your way out to try and find ways and means and solutions of trying to meet your ends to go to the banks and negotiate with them and get your payment holidays in place and all that kind of stuff and uh but i i think the biggest thing that people are going through now that i've picked up is is mindset and just realize for some people are really struggling and uh you know and and i'm just you know just say to everybody you know just keep going 
you know, just keep pushing through. We know that things are tough and, and some of you are not getting income and, you know, that kind of stuff. And keep yourself busy. I mean, on this webinar, we've had, you know, big turnout. We're also doing a number of webinars as well coming forward in all the different sectors from prop tech right the way through residential, commercial, etc. And uh, because people are looking for solutions right now, and I think this is the time, I think, for to retool yourself, you know, and uh, so I've got three sayings for everybody. You must retool, you need to reconnect, and you need to refocus. So um, if you have a bunch of bad properties, it's fine. You know, eventually you'll sell them, but don't, don't give up on looking for new ones because those new ones that you could replace, they could sort out the bad ones very, very quickly. So always have a hunter's mentality. You know, always follow the trends. You know, there's, there's, there's massive trends which are happening and try to be at the forefront of the trends. I know if it's announced in, you know, on Property24 or Business, Business Live or Business Tech or News24 or any one of those, it's too late. It's too late. The, the trend has been spotted. So don't look for them for those trends. Be the trendsetter. Be the one finding those opportunities. And uh, I think Andrew had some of his students who are a lot of those trendsetters as well. And I mean, let's just look at what's happening. You know, as a res what's happened, there's been a big trend to families migrating. You know, people that are in their twenties with their kids moving in with separate part of the houses, which are co-renting. They can't afford to rent some of them. So you get your big houses that are being converted into multi-lets. It's quite a it's quite a big trend going on in the world at the moment. So not only in South Africa. Um, obviously, the whole Airbnb market has, has died for the moment and in fact, probably for a long time to come because of worldwide travel and uh, we don't see many people traveling this year very far. So, so those kind of trends now we have to kind of put on the back burner for now. And uh, the student market, um, I would also be a little bit concerned and in terms of how e-learning is going to go because what COVID-19 is going to do, it's going to change a lot of trends of people think and how they're going to educate themselves. The normal university education might be through this method in future. Um, I know that people that are putting full day conferences with 15 different speakers through Zoom. And, uh, and it's, it's a day conference, everybody logs in and then they network through breakaway rooms. And, uh, and the same kind of experience, it doesn't cost you to fly there, it doesn't cost you to stay in a hotel, it doesn't cost you to hire a car, to pay for parking, uh, to walk in and pay your fee to it for, for that particular event. And you can do it all online and uh, for the cost. So there's all these kind of online events right now. So so retool yourself, get yourself up to speed. There's just so much going on. There's some, I mean, these kind of webinars that Scott puts on, you know, look out for them. If real estate is the place that you want to invest, you know, this is the place where you've got to come to. So the other thing is, I would say, if you're really starting out and, uh, and you don't have much funds, I would suggest is to get yourself a laptop, find a place with a good internet connection and start building a business with, for income. Because let me tell you what, if you can get that, that can, that can change your life. You know, that could, that could be a means of, to, of getting you an income that you've probably never seen before. There's just so many opportunities that are going to spring up online. And uh, so you just need to be able to get in touch with the, with the virtual world, with the cyber world, with the, World Wide Web, and uh, that's why I say it's time to retool yourself. And, you know, I, I think the, the rules of the game are changing. It's changing. It's changing all the time. And we might wake up at the end of COVID-19 and everything that we said now today is irrelevant because we're basing it only on a month ago where the world is an extremely different place. And let me tell you what, when we get off the lockdown, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be a very different world. And we, we might see it completely differently. People might respond to it very differently. So, um, so I'm just putting putting it out there that you know, just stay, keep up with the pace. You know, you know, keep yourself educated, keep yourself you know up to date with what's going. So I say, retool, you know, reconnect with all the people that you connect with, and and refocus. You know, find out what is it that you're going to do. If your business has gone bankrupt, so what? Find out what your next business is. You know, start building your new business. Find out what that's going to be. Just try and find something that you can build yourself up and, and to, to the next era after lockdown and after COVID-19 has passed because it will pass. 
So I've got your magazine on the screen and we'll also no drop a link for people so that can uh, get access to that, that report you and said. I sent you the link Scott, for the lockdown yeah, okay. guide. I emailed that through to you. Sorry, I couldn't get on to the, uh, onto the sharing. No problem. No problem. Well, uh, well, if we didn't get it for people, we'll follow up and we'll put it in the recording as well. So I just, I wanted to uh, finish and uh, and just to, I am conscious of people's time, especially uh, the four of your time as well. And it's interesting you spoke about trends, Neil. I've got a, a webinar on, on Wednesday evening at the same time. Uh, there's eight technology trends. There's eight social trends. They're both intersecting. It's creating a generational opportunity, I believe. I've been talking about it for many years. But COVID is actually, as I said earlier, pushing people up that adoption curve and, and really interested where things are going. The other thing I just wanted to point out was that, uh, particularly for Michelle, was that you know, if you take tonight, property and investing and wealth even has been a very male-dominated industry. And one of the biggest trends I see happening over the next decade is, is, is a massive uprising in women and wealth. And you know, it's, this is a really, really interesting space. And so for all the ladies that are out there, I think this is a tremendous opportunity um, in terms of where the world is going. And, you know, one of the most important reasons is that where we're going in the world is, is more of a feminine energy, which is working together. Um, you know, uh, uh, the masculine energy is the Donald Trump, I win at all costs, you lose. And, and uh, whereas, you know, the feminine energy is, is working together. And I always say to investors, you know, if, if we look at the laws of nature, a bird flying in a flock can fly 70% further than a bird flying on its own. And yet, why do we as investors try and go and do it all on our own? There's something else that's really interesting. There was some research that came out from Deepak Chakra, where he said, if someone tries to set a goal and they try to do it on their own, they've got a less than 50% chance of succeeding. If they do it with a partner, a business partner, a husband, a wife, et cetera, they've got about a 60% chance of succeeding. And if they do it in a like-minded community, they've got a higher than 70% chance of, of succeeding. So when Neil and, and Andrew, um, specifically, I think spoke about it, retooling and, and getting together, getting yourself in the right environment. And I always, I always like to say, I, I like to be the dumbest, poorest person in the room. And the reason being is you can only get better. You can, you can only go in, in one direction. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't talk about it tonight, but I see the future of where the world's going from an investment perspective is literally from your mobile phone, from your laptop. You'll be able to get access to good quality deals, whether they're in South Africa, Australia, England, America, you'll, with, with quality partners, you'll be able to get all access to the data that, that people like Michelle from TPN, et cetera, are, are creating. And ultimately, it'll allow all of us the ability to make far better decisions and, and what we call smart investments. And I, I really recommend, whether it's our platform or others, go and check them out. It is, it is happening now. You don't have to necessarily walk the streets and, and do it all on your own anymore. It's, it's just ludicrous. You know, as um, as Nelson Mandela said, money won't create the success, the freedom to make it well. And I loved what Neil said around making sure that you figure out how to go online. The world's going online, whether you like it or not. And what are you doing? You know, what are you doing to become a global citizen? And are you ready for 2020? You know, we, we, we all talk about us being ready for 2020, but were you truly ready? We all knew there was a crash coming, but were you ready for it? We all knew that the world was going digital, but were you ready for it? And it doesn't matter whether you were or you weren't learn the lessons of, of what and why, and most importantly, use this time as that pain that I spoke of right in the beginning to get you to where you want to get to. You know, whether you're wanting to, to invest in actual real estate deals, <coughs> be they local or international, you now you have those opportunities available. If you want to join inner circles and, 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 and be with like-minded investors to grow, to learn, to get the education, tonight we've shared ways of you to do it. If you literally want to start investing from $100, you can literally go online and, and do it. And, and on top of that, you know, most of us don't enjoy um, talking to call centers. We actually want to deal with people. And so, you know, when, when Neil very kindly gave out his details, Michelle gave out her details, David gave out his details, Andrew gave out his details. And these are three of my team members that, you know, I recommend. There their details are pick up a telephone, Give them a call and, and have a chat, you know, and, 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 and ask the questions that, that you want to know. So those are, those are sort of just some of the next steps. As I said to you, all the value adds that we very kindly have been uh, shared with what, by, uh, by our fellow panelists, we, we, you will find in the chat box or if you're watching the recording, 
you will get in the, in the link below. In terms of uh, Lee, I know that you've been very quiet in the background. Lee is head of our community and very kindly put this entire um, webinar on. Lee, I don't know what to do. We're two hours in, 120 minutes in, and there's about 70 questions I haven't even attempted to get close to. What do we do? <laughs> well, Scott, um, my suggestion would be that you beg and plead that our panelists stay on for uh, another 20 minutes or so if they are able to, um, and we try and get a lot of these questions answered. I know that a lot of them are around the same type of questioning, so we could probably answer about 10 in one go. Um, and for our attendees that are online, if they need to drop off, well, thank you very much for staying with us for the last two hours. It has been riveting and so much information, um, but we really do appreciate your time. And we hope that you will actually stay on for the Q&A if we can convince our panelists. Mm -hmm. I know that I've thrown you to the lion's den now, but please do stay on. Sure. Happy. See you guys, yeah. man. When you get to two hours and you still got so many questions you haven't come close to. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and but my question is if we can do this uh, shotgun style, so just sort of very quick. We 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 literally try and keep the answers short and sweet. So with regards to off-plan developments such as Harbor Arch, what are the prospects going forward with such developments? Will they continue? Can investors look at pulling out due to a lack of employment income? No, look, I think I know, I know the Harbour Arch development. I think it's a fantastic development that's been planned there. And I, and, and I think, look, don't pull out anything. You know, there's you, there just there's so much uncertainty at the moment. And I think just hold back. Um, you, you know, I would suggest not make any foolhardy decisions until lockdown, lockdown has been completely lifted. In other words, level one is gone. That's the official day that we're back to so-called normality, which I think is quite a far way away. And I don't think much can be done between then and now, because uh, so I would just I would just hold back. I'd hold back on that one and just wait until lockdown is lifted and we can deal with it as it comes. Um, I don't make any rash decisions. This is not the time to 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 start making rash decisions. Yes, uh, David's going to be busy. He's going to he's going to have uh, 10 million people saying, "I want to see this out for his rent. I want to do this." But in, in fact, you'll be so inundated, you probably won't even get to, to half the people anyway. So, and uh, so I think reality will kick in. And I think, you know, as you said, we've got to try and uh, sort of negotiate with each other and, and try to find solutions. So, but don't, don't make rest decisions now. I think just hold back. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's a question here what do I do if the tenant doesn't pay regularly and does not move out even when asked to vacate? I mean, I think I think David, you you you've answered that in in very clear terms, um, mm. and and Michelle, you did as well. And you know, at the end of the day, you need to negotiate, you need to communicate as hard as you can, and ultimately, you need to go back to contract if it's not working. I mean, that's what I heard. Yeah, I think I think that the, the, just quickly, if, if if I can give a shotgun question, just remember, guys, any advice that I do give on this platform can, cannot be held against me. So so please do consult an attorney or, or myself if you do want. Um, specific legal advice um, but the shotgun approach really is re refer to your contract try and negotiate and you know if, if, if you can't come to a compromise follow the breach provisions in the contract as strictly as possible when it, when it comes to evicting or collecting at the end of the day you know that will be determined by the courts in due course um, if, if I could just make one if I could just add one more thing um, Follow, follow your collection process. So if you have a tenant who previously prior to um, uh, lockdown was not in good standing um, and has not paid their rent, start the collection process. So start your letter of demand process. You can do it yourself, you can do it through an attorney firm, you can do it through TPN, but start your collection process in terms of your, what your lease agreement requires. Um, and you can still cancel your lease agreement. So you count your 20 business days. If it's a fixed term lease agreement, you cancel your lease. Um, obviously tenants aren't able to move at this stage, but that doesn't stop you from, from canceling um, and getting the tenant out. You're then, in, you, you're then in the position when lockdown ends to immediately act as opposed to only starting the, the, um, the, the collection process at that point. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Thanks, Joe. Sure. Um, I, the deeds office is it is it open and active again? No, I think it's going to be open from the fourth. I think mm -hmm. Michelle, is that? Yeah, I hear that as well. The fourth. Monday yeah. the fourth. 
Monday the fourth. Yeah. <laughs> It, it will be fascinating though if we in different levels of lockdown and the deeds office is active in level four and Etiquini remains in lockdown in level five, then Etiquini's deeds office won't be open, but the rest will be. It'll be fascinating to see it unfold. Yeah. Michelle, a number of people are asking how they can hear from you tomorrow. Because uh, you said you were waiting for, uh, you'd put in a, uh, sorry, I can't speak the fancy language, but you'd ask government what can, can or can't happen with people moving. Um, please, guys, uh, we, we've put out a submission and we expect to hear back by, by noon. I have a mailing list, so please, if you're online, drop me a mail to michelle at tpn.co.za. When we send out our, um, our, um, our correspondence tomorrow, I will add you to that, um, to, to that list. Yeah, Thanks. and just to add to that as well, we, we've also submitted uh, our representations to basically get clarity on what, on what the Level 4 lockdown means. In so far as people moving moving from different residences, leases, buying, selling, those kinds of situations. So we should we should hopefully hear tomorrow as well. Anne has asked a question: what do you do in the case where the banks evaluate the property for less than the property than the purchase price? Do you encourage buyers to top up with own cash on top of the evaluation? I think Scott, in that case, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean if the bank's gone out there, they've and for example, the purchase price is a million, and the and the and the bank have, and the banks have valued the property at nine hundred. Uh, no, I wouldn't top it up. I'd go back to the seller and renegotiate with the seller, and say, look, here's the valuation, um, and then I'll probably go to the to TPN's property report and say, look at all the sold data, um, and I would use that as as my negotiation. So no, don't top it up. Go back and renegotiate. Kerry's asked a question, is there any relief for landlords who are sitting with empty units due to the new tenant not being able to move in from the 1st of April due to lockdown? No. Uh, uh, Michelle, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't know if you, if you qualify as a small business and, and, and rental is your, is, your, is your business, would, would you not qualify? Um, fascinating. I hadn't thought about it like that. Um, the, the reality is, though, that the tenants that are supposed to be, especially if you've had a lease agreement, you may have a lease agreement that was due to start on the 1st of April and your incoming tenant is not able to move in and your property has stood vacant. The reality is that tenant is somewhere else and probably paying rent at the property that he wasn't expecting to be at um, in any event. So, so, yeah. so I, I certainly don't think that you've got a claim against your um, incoming tenant. They're unable to take occupation. You don't have a claim for rent against them. As soon as lockdown um, um, opens up and the tenant is then liable for the rent from that point on. Um, fascinating, David, to see if you could go and get some sort of um, small business um, uh, relief. Not sure. Michelle, we tried that. One of my students, four properties, did go for the relief. Did go for the relief and was rejected. So you and never got go. it. Yeah. Okay, so here's an interesting one, and uh, we can all buy each other the winner dinner in uh, 12 months. The question <laughs> is, um, do you have an idea what percentage drop in property price? So, so let's not assume it'll go down. One of us could be uh, the other way, so it'll go up. But is property going to go up or down in the next 12 months? And it's a guess, but what's your number? And I'm going to record it, and I'll remind you all in 12 months' time. 20%. <laughs> it's going down, guys. Yeah. Yeah. So, the so, okay, so we're looking at so, the longer, so on a voting basis, we've got five again. votes for a down, basically. I'm going to 15, 15 20 percent. House is worth a million and worth 800. 20 percent. 20 percent. I think the longer lockdown extends for, the more the price will decrease because that's lo that means the longer people are not earning an income, the more distressed they become. You have to guess, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a true economist. It might go up and it might go down, depending on how long or not long the lockdown goes on for. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would chuck a caveat in there and, uh, and, and add in real prices as well, because I think the, the impact of, of both inflation and currency, it, it, has a, it does have an impact that people need to take into account. Um, Right, uh, listening from East London. So I'm just trying to go through these questions as quick as I can. Uh, middle size retailers we discussed. I've quite a lot of inquiries. 
but quite a lot of inquiries for people wanting to view my properties during lockdown. I've, it's not a question; it's a comment. So I don't really know what to say about that. Um, the only the only thing I would say, and I think I think Michelle or Andrew, you said it, but I I, I do know even in Australia where people are selling stuff with online walkthroughs and stuff uh, of properties. Yeah. No, so I mean, when the, you know when the lockdown happened the day before, um, I actually did a 360 tour of the property, and the property I said that I couldn't sell, I actually got a lead today, funny enough. So I sent her a link to the virtual 360. She goes, "I'd like to view your property after lockdown, even though I won't sell it now." But I said, "Well, listen, don't, you know, I've got a 360 tour, and I sent it to her from right from the front to the back." 360 and I realized and I said so I'll tell you what we'll do step one watch the link step two let's do an offer to purchase um, you know where we can sign it online if we do it but I know I know that I'm not going to sell that specific property now but what I got out of that is that people don't have to all you know don't have to buy it I mean don't don't have to view the property there's 362 no. I've done and what I've done is as you walk through the property there's little videos that are popping up saying so this is the kitchen this is what's over there there's a small crack or there's damp coming up and as the person's virtue whether they're using the goggles or it's on their phone it's not just like a 360 tour where you just walk in and view it there's interactive videos coming everywhere and that is what's going to take shape i think um, in the next few months that's how we're going to start selling properties uh, Andrew, I, I mean neil and i were doing that as far back as 2012 neil remember we we're going looking at 50 hours a day and bloody filming yeah. them, sending them back to clients, or, you know, whatever. Neil, question from a guy, Scott, uh, can Bruce. I, can I jump in there? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, just, I just wanted to add to that, Andrea, and I, and I think that absolutely both sales and resident and um, letting industry is definitely going that way. Just just a comment though, what, what we've done to try and accommodate some of our clients, both from a, from a letting and from a sales perspective, is just to incorporate clauses into the respective agreements just to say, you know, basically it's the finalization of the agreement is subject to physical viewing after lockdown. And that's to the extent that people want to, are prepared to wait, you know, just just uh, for what it's worth. Yeah. Neil, question here, and I'm not sure why why you were asked specifically, but uh, it literally says, Neil, will all the <laughs> South African banks survive this period? Will all the South African? Banks, banks, will the banks survive? How will they survive? No, will no, look, they survive? Think, so will all of them survive? No, look, banks banks will, will, will definitely come to this. I mean, you know, they've got uh, reinsurance in place and, and that kind of stuff. So, look, uh, you know, they, they, they pretty much have to, you know, I don't want to go into the whole sort of uh, operation of how banks work, but they, let me tell you what, they, South African banks are pretty well capitalised. And uh, even though I would say COVID-19 is probably an absolutely unusual event, um, what they've really offered uh, uh, their clients, the majority of the banks, is three-month payment holiday. So they don't have to pay their, their bonds for the next three months, uh, provided you obviously do that application with them, as Michelle mentioned uh, earlier on. They're certainly going to make it up uh, through, the, through the interest back on top of that a little bit later. So. Uh, in fact, I had a very private call, and I won't mention which bank it was, with to say, guys, listen, what happens in month four? Because and there's another default in month four, and they got that in, and they said, no, that's a separate conversation. Can we have that one? But I think, I think, I don't think it's it's absolute and complete disaster. They kind of just put a freeze, and um, they put a freeze on obviously their clients who understand that they're under distress and they can't pay. So they pretty much just carry it over over the next three months, and uh, and obviously they've realised that you know they've seen the distress that is in the market there. So it would be foolhardy of them not to to actually give their guys a holiday. But I think that we at, at, I think they capitalise at least for a a year. I think if this thing goes on for a protracted period of time, and there's real problems in the commercial sector because I think that's where there's more risk. Um, is in the co commercial sector. Although a lot of the commercial owners, I've got to say that the, their loan to values are extremely low. I mean, many of them are, you know, they, it's around about 30% loan to, to value. So they keep them, they manage their debt to, to equity ratios very well. And uh, so I, I don't think it's, at this stage, I don't think it's a concern. I think we'll have to, we'll have to look at around about September 
I mean, to see that situation. It all depends on obviously how this whole COVID-19 plays out, which we don't know. It's, it's a lot of uncertainty around that. And then I think we will have a more accurate picture. Michelle, someone is asking here, and I don't know if you're the best to answer it. I, I certainly am not, but I, you know, I just thought I'd give it a go. It was uh, the best value, uh, don't you think now we'd be the best value for non-city bank index? Now that we're no longer investment grade, would funds flow here from people who want to take more risks? I don't know if, if you feel, if anyone wants no, to, to give an opinion. I'm, I'm definitely not qualified to answer that. Perfect. No, look, I, uh, I mean, look, I, I, what I would suggest is whoever's asked that question, go watch the Ray Dalio comment from a week ago about capital flows around the world and where money is moving during these times. And uh, as, as the person that runs the largest hedge fund in the world, I think he's got a little bit, a little bit more to say than five of us. Uh, for, for a newcomer in the property market, is the right time to invest in property development market and which market should we look at as a possible option? I think we've covered that uh, quite extensively tonight between residential, student, commercial, uh, social housing, etc. Um, and again, go back, listen to the recording, listen to the different sectors, listen to even the research that uh, Michelle spoke about, Neil spoke about different sectors. Uh, Kanye asked, is Airbnb a good thing to focus on during this time? Um, no. Neil, I, no. I know you spoke a little bit of Airbnb. No, I think, look, I mean, obviously, because people are, are limited with travel. And uh, so the biggest, I mean, it was actually a booming market up until the end of February and doing exceptionally well. And it was a very different conversation then. Today, obviously, there's so much uncertainty. And, uh, you know, so I would just park that, that idea for now to come back. But I don't. I think that's gonna that's gonna take a while. It's gonna take about two years before it comes back proper again. So um, it's time, as I say, to you know, refocus, retool. You know, look at something else, and you know, follow the trends. Just just, just watch what's going on. Uh, it's not the end of Airbnb. I think it will be back. No, look, I think so. Look, I mean, I had a skiing holiday booked to France in March, and it got cancelled. It's not very nice having your holidays cancelled. So yeah, Michelle, um, mm -hmm. how does someone get on the tenant? A credit bureau to get valuations for property ah oh, so that's on our shop so it's um shop.tpn.co.za um you can then click on there's um a number of different reports there's the investor report that is a fabulous wealth of information you do that on a suburb and you can either do it on a single suburb or you can join suburbs together to get uh, whatever data you want um, from a suburb perspective um, and then you've got the property valuation report. So there you go down to the exact if and portion number that you're looking for, and you get a valuation on the property, but you also get a whole bunch of trend information um, on the property as well, as well as rental price trending on the property. So we give a per square meter price um, for that area for different size properties, freehold versus a sectional title. Um, and that way you can quite quickly work out what the yield is on a, on a property if you're looking at it for an investment perspective. You've got the valuation and you've got the rental components um, in that uh, report. Thanks, Michelle. Andrew, uh, view on the UK residential market. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's the same conversation as, as yeah, Scott. Um, I jumped onto a UK RLA, the Residential Landlord Association, uh, Association last week and um, you know, it's the same concerns as yeah, Scott. Are we going to see a price drop? Yes, we will. I mean, in January and February, you know, looking at house prices and we were actually on the up compared to last year. And the UK residential market was actually looking really good. Um, and obviously, with COVID 19, like the rest of the world, is it going to slow down? Yes. You know, I've got a letting agency there, Scott, and we've got a few hundred properties that we look after, and we've seen the exact same thing in the, in the UK. You know, tenants are losing jobs, and where we have these multi-lets, you know, they're moving back out with their mom and dad. Uh, but the difference with the UK is their lockdown is, excuse me, is rubbish. Lockdown doesn't exist in the UK. My staff are still allowed to work. Move-ins and move-outs are still happening. So you mentioned in London that you can't move the tenants in. You can was said on this on this live webinar if a tenant needs to move out and the tenant can move out and if a tenant we out move tenants into properties but i'm like where's the lockdown so even though um uh, even though you know yes there's all the uncertainty and there is a slowdown activity we still right now we're still renovating properties we have trade not not because we want to but because they can 
tradesmen are still renovating properties. Um, we're still taking inquiries, and you know things 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 are still you know things are still moving. So so when they say the UK is in lockdown, I, I, I doubt it, and that's what you're saying about how you respect our leader, right? Because our lockdown is you are locked down. So but still, I mean, my my personal portfolio, Scott, I got full rental from all my tenants. Um, so very fortunate about that in the UK. Um, am I too concerned about the UK market? I'm personally not. You know, you know, as we have our downgrade, downgrade over here with COVID over there, we have Brexit. I'll be honest, I forgot about Brexit. Um, you know, the whole COVID thing. But I think the UK, you know, your average property, um, like here, yeah, I focus on properties below 1.5 million. And touch wood, I don't go wrong. In the UK, I focus on properties below 100,000 rand because that's the average price that an, an average Englishman can afford to rent or buy. And touch wood, I've never gone wrong with that philosophy. So no, I'm not. I would be cautious of investing in London. I'd be cautious of I'd be cautious of investing in those big cities. But out in the you know three four hours north of London, still still getting the yields. Still it, is a, it, is a, it is getting late in the evening, but I do want you to show me how you can buy a house in England for less than 100,000 rands, because that's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to point out that it's definitely 100,000 pounds. I, 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 I threw you off my grades, I can. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question here from, um, about uh, evictions and can they get payment holidays and all this. You know, again, it's, it's different for every person. Go speak to your bank if you can. Um, you know, if you can, you can. If you can't, you can't. Um, what's the best case scenario during non or underpayment by tenants, uh, four months or longer? Um, I don't know, uh, David. I mean, that's to your question, I suppose. Um, in terms of evictions and everything else, they're asking best case scenario yeah. during four months or longer. Scott, there, there's no one size fits all in, you know, in, in these kinds of scenarios, unfortunately. It, it, it is a case by case sort of investigation that you need to go on. Um, but, you know, as I said before, from a general perspective, there's no such thing as payment holidays when it comes to rental, um, residential or commercial leases. You know, they have to be dealt with on, on their merits. Um, I, I think that's a misconception that's been pushed, you know, through the media and, and, and perhaps the banks that there's you know, people are automatically entitled to rent for holidays. It, it, in my view, it doesn't exist. You know, a case must be dealt with on its merits, and it must you must look at the contract. Okay. Right. Um, someone just saying, Michelle, you've got some great documents and guidelines on your website, uh, particularly for COVID as well. So, um, you know, just a recommendation from someone else that's come through here. That wasn't you. That was as in someone's recommending uh, what you've got. So uh, that you know, people must uh, go check that. Uh, what are my rights as a tenant? Um, you know, not utilised during lockdown. Uh, you know, again, I think uh, I think we've discussed that. Sorry, I'm I'm jumping through some of these. If we don't, we will literally be here till midnight because uh, as fast as we're answering them, more are coming through. Um, can residential tenants in the UK be evicted? Um, so again, it's it's pretty similar all over the world. Um, you know, UK, USA, Australia, and even South Africa, where it's actually quite hard at the moment uh, to do it. I mean, I don't know, Andrew, anything from your side. You, 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 you can't, it's very difficult to evict people at the moment. Yeah, you know, they, they're stopping it like, yeah, so they're not, you know, because they're so conscious of their, 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 their homeless issue they've got there um, already. And yeah, no, evicting tenants is going to be very difficult in the UK where the, where the judge will, will pause and will, will halt it. And it's, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to evict it. If, if I'm not mistaken, the a halt on all evictions. Yeah. David, I know you work with some of the biggest developers, and Neil, I know you do as well. Someone's just asking here yeah, from a developer's perspective, would it be a good strategy to continue with land development applications, which entail regulatory processes and approvals to continue um, you know, during these times? Um, it's how long is a piece of string, yeah. to be quite frank. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think if, yeah, if it is I mean, level three, I think it's level three, then I think the construction industry is back. I think partly some of them they can get back. But yeah, it's level three and then I think it's almost the planning departments and all that. For them, I think that that industry, the real estate industry opens on level three. So and that includes construction and everything else. So so we hope we get to level three soon that we start seeing the loosening of, of that happening. And uh, obviously, construction is a massive, uh, you know, employer of people as well. So we hope that that, that is sooner rather than later. 
have it? Yeah, look, I mean, to the extent that you can get as much admin done as possible, you know, there's there's no reason not to carry on with that. But I, but I do know that uh, a lot of the licensing departments and some of the municipal departments dealing with those kinds of applications will only go back um, a level down. So mm -hmm. even if you wanted to, I don't think that you could at the moment. Yeah. Neil, the other good point with level three is we can buy alcohol, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, with, uh, with uh, another comment here by, by someone, uh, medical is obviously something to look at because of because of the need for doctors. Someone made a comment here and also um, light yeah, industrial. So um, things like, I mean, imagine if you could own an Amazon commercial site, you know, from a logistics perspective, et cetera. So um, there's, there, is, there are advantages in, in these uh, times. Uh, right, I'm just trying to look through here quickly. Someone asked about the price of South African property with regards to US dollar values. We've discussed that in terms of currency. Um, I think, you know, there's a whole presentation I have I can give, and Neil and I have done this for so long. I'll never forget where we were doing an event for America with Neil and Dolph, like in 2012, 2013. And at the time, the rand was somewhere around eight rand the dollar. And people were like, no, no, I'm going to wait for it to strengthen. And, and you yeah. know, and then it was like over 10. So, you know, just, it always interests me, you know, scenario planning and waiting for it to get, you know, better, supposedly. Um, <clears throat> shit, I don't know where to start here. Uh, where can you get the data? Michelle's giving you that. Uh, struggling to pay my bond. Am I, uh, am I better off debt counselling? So, no, my understanding from what Michelle said and, and if you go and negotiate with bank and get a debt holiday, it doesn't affect your credit rating. So it's definitely the best place to start. I presume, Michelle, that would be yeah. your advice. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, I don't know how to go through all these questions quickly. Why can we not develop affordable housing using 3D print technology like they've done in 2019 in Mexico? Why are we bound bound to brick and mortar? I don't know if anyone wants to give that a go. Yeah, then, South African Bureau of Standards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's one of them. But it's, it's interesting, there's also a culture. I actually hosted a, an affordable housing con conference in Kenya, Nairobi last year in May. And there were quite a few international firms trying to push different ways of investing in Africa in affordable housing. And there's different ways. One is 3D printing which is quite affordable. The other one is, of course, uh, sort of concrete structures. And then the third one is also metal structures. But the problem is, you know, you have to roll them out in mass amounts. But more importantly, there has to be a culture change, you know, in, you know, and South Africans, we swell, you know, we bricks and mortar people. We go to the UK and we see these houses made of cardboard and wood and they're selling for millions of, you know, and, and, and in the US, and we kind of say that, you know, we're not used to that kind of thing. So um, it's, there's a, there, there needs to be a culture change, I think, especially if we need to, uh, you know, develop mass housing at affordable prices. So there's a whole lot of reasons behind it, but, but I think most of it's got to do with culture because it, it's happening, but mainly in, in more advanced sort of economies. Not in emerging, not in Africa. It doesn't seem to, of course, only in Africa. There's a question here that's come up by quite a few different people asked in different ways. I realized early in the webinar, I'm not even close to everyone's level in this discussion. I'd like some advice. I don't have capital to invest in property, but is it a good time to buy your first property as a primary residence? And you know, my comment to this is that you've heard many different uh, tonight, a lot of information. Um, the first lesson in investing is to invest in yourself. So, you know, go and get the knowledge. You know, Neil's got plenty of, I mean, all of them actually have plenty of, of information <laughs> for free that you can go and read. I mean, Michelle, Andrew, and David have all got it, uh, including ourselves as well. And um, and so go and read that stuff, um, you know, and, and, and get the information. But also make sure you don't get analysis paralysis. You know, you never learn to walk by reading a book. And at some point, you've got to stand up and get going. So, yes, I just um, I think on that point, eh, um, I think it's important for the people that have never bought a property before. Um, on Saturday, we actually launched what's called a first-time buyer product, uh, where the where the investor of the year last year 
um, or his first product, he's gone out and he's interviewed the banks, the bond originators, the property inspectors, the attorneys, and what's an offer to purchase. So for that individual, like you said, invest in yourself and understand the property market. That's the first thing, understand what you're getting yourself into. And we actually do have a first time buy product for, for that individual. Oh, perfect, perfect. There's a bunch of questions here. Is it better for new investors to invest locally and or should they invest offshore or you know, etc.? My suggestion there is um, you know, go and watch our wealth masterclass. We did it two weeks ago, it's recorded, and um, I went through that in a huge amount of detail. It, there's no right answer, it depends on what you're trying to achieve yourself. Um oh, just, uh I'm very interested in the woman and wealth. Um perfect. That's I've just by the way, uh, Michelle. Um, Hilda Landestead and, and the team actually had a meeting just this evening about it and we, we're so excited about this, this massive opportunity in India, in China, it's one of the biggest trends I think that we're going to see over the next 10 years, um, it, which is more inclusion of, of uh, women into the whole wealth space um, and yeah, that's really exciting. I, think. I can tell you from our data, um, we looked at um, women buying investment properties or people buying investment properties and we classified males and females and then we classified them by their age categories and um, pre-COVID-19 uh, the biggest um, demographic of people investing in um, investment properties or buying into investment properties were the young women generation, the 18 to 30 year olds uh, females were the most active in terms of buying investment properties um, um, at the moment. And uh, the people who had um, overbought in the 2004, 5, 6, 7 period, you know, the property boom period, that overcommitted, overleveraged, overbought, um, those were our men, mid, 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 middle-aged men who bailed. <laughs> <laughs> in, um, basically, in the basically, Neil, basically Neil, Andrew, and David. That's Scott. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, awesome, Michelle. Thank you for that. It's uh, there's a group in China we work with. They've got two million customers. Now, when I mean customers, I don't mean a database. It's two million paid for customers, and. 86% uh, of the women and the average age is 31. So just so interesting based on your stats. Um, okay, if people want links to all the different things that we've spoken about, we will put, be sending in a follow-up email with all the different links, including webinars, etc. cetera. Um, we all want to get going. Frustration that we locked down, our residential developments are indefinitely stalled. Yep, we all agree with that. Um, please add me to the mailing list. Thank you, Andrew. What about the law that says you can't evict a person who has become unemployed? You also have to continue to pay electricity and water. I don't know, David, if you want to talk to that quickly, uh, the law says you can't evict someone who's become unemployed. I'm not aware of that law, uh, Scott. It's, uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I have something to learn tonight, but I'm not aware of that law. There's, there's, there's a regulation in place during COVID-19 to say that people can't be evicted from residential premises. But that's not linked necessarily to to employment, and and it's not going to it's certainly not going to be the situation moving forward. I don't think. Different sure. people are giving different opinions on different sectors and whether they think it's going to go up or go down. Um, asking about municipality revaluations, <laughs> and rates increases. I mean, I know Michelle, you've talked a bit about that. Um, I mean, I don't think anything's going to happen quickly, surely. No, so so properties are revalued um, every five years, and you run through those you run through those cycles. Um, the problem now is um, if you've just had a revaluation and we see a massive decline in in property uh, values, your valuation is stuck as as what it at what it was revalued at um, for that five year period until the next tranche of revaluations. Someone said, yeah, I purchased a property during lockdown and one of my suspensive conditions was to view the property we signed an OTP. It's quite clever, you know, low, low demand, <laughs> high supply, might, might get it at a good price. Um, another one here is uh, we all, we're, all, we're all responding to a major extreme risk. Are we ready if the internet went down in 18 to 24 months? Look, I think we're all learning and that's why I love Tim Santa with his scenario planning. We need to be looking and future-proofing ourselves. I mean, who would have said oil would go to virtually nothing? <laughs> it's like it's virtually unheard of, you know. So, uh, can you say something about business insurance? 
I think we covered that. Um, the insurance does not cover COVID-19. I don't know if anyone wants to cover that um, around business insurance for a lodge owner. What, what, what sort of insurance, uh, Scott? I don't suppose you have any more detail so, there. Can I, can I say for the purposes of the fact that it's nearly 10 o'clock at night, um, if the individual <laughs> could reach out directly um, and, and actually ask, because because like you're saying, David, it's it's how long is a piece of string in terms of the actual, you know, the yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not, it's yeah, maybe, not I mean, naive. Sorry, yeah. Maybe you could post some of the questions, Scott, and, uh, you know, send it I'm through to who. <laughs> nearly there I'm, I'm, we we answering them now faster than they're coming in so we nearly sort of uh let's not be naive the banks are only looking after themselves they're not doing anyone any favors the three-month payment holiday will make them even more money uh, there's a different way you can take every context and uh you know from from my perspective don't disagree with you um however it's not necessarily a negative you know at the end of the day we are a capitalist society and and people need to make money otherwise they go bankrupt it's, it's that simple including governments by the way and uh this this ongoing printing of money can't continue forever for everybody um okay, people are saying thank you very much andrew we need to talk um i married a wealth guy sure uh, uh very interesting email context okay email context given too fast don't worry we'll email out tomorrow i'll make sure that lee and i send out a follow-up to everyone uh, with all the links can i buy a property in the uk if i have my security in south africa uh yes the answer is you you can but it's but it depends on the question you're asking because if you think you're going to get a mortgage from the bank based on south african security it's pretty much no um yeah, so it's it's and Anne's asking that question, and I would suggest you know get in contact with ourselves or Andrew or whatever. But that's a much more detailed question. I, I will I will say one thing. I bought a house in London. I told you already, my first one in two thousand two. I tried to buy one about a year ago, and getting a mortgage was more difficult than getting my master's degree in London um, as a as a <laughs> foreigner. And I have a British passport with an overseas income and everything else. It was flipping ridiculous, and the, the fastest way. You know, they talk about OPM, other people's money. What I've learned nowadays is it's not OPM, other people's money. It's other people's mortgages. And I actually partnered with a guy in England. And the best rate I could get was like five and a half, six percent once you took all the cost centering into account. And we got we got it fixed for 3.19 percent. It made absolutely a no brainer based on cash on cash in partnering. So just I would I would really recommend thinking out the box there um, as to what's possible. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for everyone. Uh, looking into crystal ball, how long do you predict to take? This is a good one because I'm quite interested. You know, basically what Peter's saying is, how long do you take for us to get to like level two or one lockdown? Anyone want to venture a guess there? No, no, no way. No, because I mean, as I mentioned right up front, I mean, we could go down to to level three. We could even go down to level two. But remember that we could actually reverse back up to level five. So we don't know if everything, you know, it all depends on how the stats play out. We could go back into full lockdown again. So um, just thinking because we're going from five, four, three, two, one, the logical thing, lockdown over, it could go in the reverse. So I, I don't want to make any predictions on that one. No ways. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My perspective. Sorry, after you, Michelle. No, I was just going to say, winter is a very long time, and we, we don't know the effect of this in our winter. Um, yeah. So. yeah, that's uh, yeah. I, uh, no, anyway, I'm not going to say what I was about to say publicly because I get into trouble for it. So, uh, mm -hmm. right. What, uh, uh, last question, yeah, the good news is it is the last question. Um, why? And so, just by the way, there's plenty of comments coming through thanking you all for your time. I, I equally really appreciate your time. It's been wonderful, and hopefully, you've got value out of this. And uh, I, I mean, the, the hundreds of people that have been online tonight. There have been so many uh, positive compliments, and the fact that we've still got so many online uh, <laughs> two and a half hours later is phenomenal. Um, Paul just said, "Why don't we see the severe fluctuations in residential property in SA compared to the USA?" Um, etc. Paul, from my experience, and Neil and I were on the ground. It's because they gave out credit so much easier. You know, in they, they had things called dinky loans, uh, ninja loans, which was no income, no job. 
you know, we, we literally met people where they said if you breathe into a into a mirror and and um, if, if, if mist came out, they would give you a mortgage. I mean, and I'm not joking, Neil was there. Like, we literally met these people on the ground. So, you know, the one thing I think in psychology terms is that in America, their attitude is, you know, go big or go home. And if you go bankrupt, it doesn't matter. Like tomorrow morning, you just get up and get started again. Whereas like in South Africa, if you go bankrupt, they don't give your grandchildren, you know, credit. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a different psychology. And we could go, I mean, we could spend a whole webinar on, but I, mm -hmm. I honestly think it's because it's a lot stricter, like it is in, like it is in Australia. And that's why you don't see these, these large fluctuations. Um, yeah, well, we would speak for hours. I don't know, Neil, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, no, look, I think you pretty much wrapped it up. I think uh, the, the the problem with all that bad debt, it was actually sold, you know, to, to Iceland, which bankrupt Iceland. And uh, so they were sold as sort of mortgage securities. And that's a problem, which is unsold and unsold and unsold. So, and, uh, and they thought they were all triple triple A uh, rated loans, and they weren't. They they were actually all bad books up because they saw people defaulting um, on the, on those loans quite significant, and that caused the crash. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Last question for the evening, and I'm not going to allow any more to come through. It's a nice way to end off. The world's changing. I heard tonight an overwhelming uh, coming through from all of you negotiate, communicate, take into account what people are going through, both on the, you know, whether you're the landlord or the tenant. And someone's asked chair, if you would re if you were negotiating a fair reduction in in rent, what what do you think would be fair? Um, it's a nice way to end off because if we, you know, they always say create the world you you want to see or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And and you know, if you if the shoe was on the other foot, what do you think is fair? I guess Michelle, yeah, that's you. Michelle, that's you. Okay, so <laughs> we are not suggesting a reduction in rent for residential tenants. We are suggesting a deferment in rent, which is different. And it's about saying, I don't have the income now, um, but I will catch it up. And I enter into an agreement to catch it up over installment payments in future months. Yeah, Perfect. an acknowledgement of debt, essentially. Yeah, and I think I think yeah. I had a situation now where, you know, I, uh, I you know I was due the increase or whatever at the end of the month, and they agreed to sign another twelve months, but we agreed to keep it at the same price. Now you could argue it's a bad business or whatever. I decided it was better than having uh, two three months vacancy plus paying you know all the costs and you know blah blah blah. So um, you know really it just comes down to uh, your own intuition of what's right and wrong. And I, as I always try and look at, what would you do if, if you were on the other side of the fence? You know, what, what will you be proud of to tell your kids about one day? So on that basis, I really want to thank everyone. Thanks for your time. I hope that it's added value to you. Um, I really look forward to further discussions like this. It's, it's, it's been a nice group, nice energy. I really, really appreciate all the input that you've come from. And I love the different angles we've come from, you know, different industry expertise, different characters, different, different people doing different things in the industry. And yet one thing we all do care about, which is uh, the future and, and, and clients and, and people, investors being able to make the right decisions. And, and that's why I really appreciate you giving up well, hours of your time now to, to share with people. And so thank you very much. And thanks to all the people who've been online. You know, really, you know, go out there and tell people. I think as Neil said, we're all living in doom or gloom. We're all watching crap on the news or listening to stuff. Rather come and be on places like this with Feed Your Mind and, and you know, hopefully tonight we've shared with you many, many different places. And so thank you, Michelle. Thank you, David. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Andrew and Lee. Thank you to you and your team, you and your team for putting this together as well. Great, sir. Thanks, Scott. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Good night, everyone. Lee. Bye -bye. Thanks for joining us. Yes. Scott. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Michelle. Yeah.